Sergeants, can we please start the recordings? PC recording good. Cloud recording started. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Martinez. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council uh, fiscal year 2022 executive budget hearing of the Committee on Finance jointly with the Committee on Public Safety. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification purposes. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at the following address. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, and again, welcome to the City Council's fourth day of hearings. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Fourth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum, and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined uh, by the Committee on Public Safety, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Adrian Adams. We are also joined by the following Council members. Bear with me one moment. Adams, Amphrey Samuels, Lewis, Matteo, Perkins, Menchaca, Riley, Holden, the public advocate, Jamani Williams, council members Lander, Diaz, Felice, Koslowitz, Rodriguez, Powers, and Cornegan. The NYPD's fiscal 2022 executive budget is $5.4 billion, representing 5.5% of the city's total proposed budget for next year. Of this $5 billion or 92% is personnel services spending to support a workforce of over 52,000 people. The executive budget is $211 million more than in fiscal 2021 than the fiscal 2021 adopted budget. In many ways, this budget feels like deja vu all over again, because in this budget, the mayor's office either reversed or simply did not implement many parts of the budget deal that were reached for the fiscal 2021 adopted budget. I'll mention two specific areas by way of example. The first is the NYPD's overtime budget. Last year, we agreed to reduce the uniform overtime budget by $295 million. The current fiscal year 21 budget for uniform overtime is $240 million. But with two months still left in the fiscal year, the NYPD has completely blown past this amount and already spent $307 million. Moreover, this $67 million in overspending is not even reflected in the executive budget, leaving us to wonder where the administration thinks this extra money will come from. For next year, fiscal 2022, the uniform overtime budget is higher at $354 million, meaning that the administration has rolled back the overtime cuts that we agreed to last year. In addition, no civilian overtime cuts were extended beyond this fiscal year. It seems clear that the administration has no plan in place or maybe even no desire to control runaway overtime spending. Second is the transfer of school safety agents out of the NYPD. While we all understood that this would be a process that would take time and therefore would not be reflected in the fiscal 2021 budget, the administration is not showing any progress towards this effort in the fiscal 2022 budget or out years either. The financial plan provides spending plans up to fiscal 25, so it is, so it is possible to show the transfer of school safety even if the transfer, transfer is not immediate. However, the budget does show increases in budgeted civilian headcount for fiscal 2022. There is a new need for 188 additional civilian positions to serve as community assistants and ambassadors. The council is informed that these new roles are intended to facilitate a link between the police and the communities they serve, but we do not have any information about the experience that will be required to be qualified for these positions, like whether they will need a social work background. 
And given all the conversations that have been had about police reform over this past year, we really need to ask, is the police department the agency that should be in charge of community relations? Wouldn't this investment be better made elsewhere? We look forward to engaging in that conversation, as well as learning more details about the NYPD's proposed budget during today's hearing. I'll now turn it over to Councilmember Adams for her opening remarks. Councilmember Adams. Thank you very much, Chair Drummond. Good morning to everyone that is joining us for this hearing this morning. I'm Councilmember Adrian Adams, Chair of the Public Safety Committee of the New York City Council. The New York City Police Department's fiscal 2020 budget is $5.44 billion. This is up from the current fiscal 2021 budget, which is $5.41 billion. The NYPD budget has been a focus of the council's reforms to policing. These reforms led to last year's cuts to the budget, which allowed the city to fund social service and educational programs during a once in a lifetime pandemic. We also passed several pieces of legislation and a wide ranging reform plan. Among the issues we've tackled is the disciplinary system at NYPD, which until recently was not transparent, not just, and did not have proper oversight. We've expanded the portfolio of violations that the CCRB investigates, passed a disciplinary matrix that standardize, standardizes punishments, and this budget also adds 15 new positions to monitor an early intervention system, which would identify problematic officers before they commit any crimes, misdeeds, or violations. While we want to ensure the internal system at the NYPD has the proper checks and balances, we also want to ensure its effectiveness in the city. This year, murders are up 18% versus the same period last year. Shootings are up 83%. In just the first four months of this year, there were over 400 shootings. This is a part of a larger trend across the country that we need to get a hold of. We need to identify the roots behind these problems to make long-term solutions and also ensure day-to-day -day safety in the short term. To be clear, we know that a lack of resources at the NYPD is surely not a problem. NYPD staffing levels are at the same average they've been at over the last 20 years when we saw dramatic declines in violence. Over, the, over time this year is lower, but all the canceled events this year allowed NYPD to easily save on overtime expenditures. We should look at how to improve the relationships between police officers and local communities. The relationship should not be antagonistic. It should be restorative. We need to look at how to improve the service in the motto, protect and serve. I'd like to hear more about the new positions of community assistants and community ambassadors. I'd also like to make sure that we're not just paying lip service to reform, but ensuring that we fix the power imbalance and work to build a system that is more of a partnership between police and all New Yorkers. I'm going to move quickly because we have a lot to discuss today. I know my colleagues have a lot to talk about today, but before we get started, I do want to thank our public safety committee staff, Nevin Singh, Dan Addis, and Matthew Thompson. I'd also like to thank from my staff, my legislative director, Benjamin Feng, for his work on today's hearing. Well, now, uh, turn it back over to Chair Trump. Thank you very much, Chair Adams. And let me say we have been joined. I think we left off uh, uh, with Karen Koslowitz being here, Council Members Rodriguez, Powers, Cornegie, also Council Members Rosenthal and Miller, and Gibson and Brannon have joined us. Now we will hear testimony from the police department. We are joined by the police, by Police Commissioner Dermot Shea and the senior staff of the NYPD. Before the NYPD begins their testimony, I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items and to swear in the witnesses. Thank you, Chair Drum. My name is Rebecca Chasen and I am counsel to the New York City Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. 
If you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. So please be aware that there could be a delay in that process and bear with us and be patient. Today, we will hear, we will hear testimony from the New York Police Department. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on to speak. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to the administration witnesses and call on each of you to so affirm. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, Police Commissioner Shea? Yes, I do. First Deputy Commissioner Tucker? Yes, I do. Chief Harrison? Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Ryan? Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Hart? Yes, I do. Assistant Deputy Commissioner Chernyovsky? Yes, I do. Chief Essig? Yes, I do. Chief Holmes? Yes, She's I in do. in a different room. I do. Uh, Chief Galati? I'll come back to Chief Galati. Chief LePetri? Yes, I do. Chief Morales? Okay, no. Yes, I do. Chief Corey? Yes, I do. Chief Pantillo? Yes, I do. Chief Madry. Yes, I do. Chief O'Reilly. Yes, I do. Chief Barrer. Yes, I do. Chief Reister. Yes, I do. Chief Spinella. Yes, I do. Chief Tobin. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Miller. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Litwin. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Meisenholder. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Martinez. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Parker. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Pemberton. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Frazier. Yes, I do. Deputy Chief Obey. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. And Chief Galati. I think Chief Miller is going to basically cover Chief Galati. Uh I, I don't know if I'm unmuted now. I was unable to unmute myself. Yes, we hear you, sir. Okay. Yes, yes, I do. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. And Police Commissioner Shea, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Chair Adams, Chair Drum, and members of the City Council. Thank you for the opportunity.
to discuss the mayor's executive budget for the 2022 fiscal year. Before highlighting some key budget items, I'd like to discuss the challenges we are facing as we attempt to rebound and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. First and foremost among these challenges is the increase in shootings that plagues our streets. Just several of the hundreds of victims last year include a seven-year-old girl shot in East Harlem in June, a one-year-old boy shot and killed in Bedford-Stuyvesant in July, a seven-year-old boy shot in Crown Heights in September, and an eight-month-old girl shot in Mott Haven later that month. Also, a nine-year-old girl shot in Central Harlem on Halloween trick-or-treating. And in addition to a five-year-old girl shot in East New York last month, this past weekend's violence saw two adult tourists and a four-year-old Brooklyn girl shopping for toys with her family, shot in Times Square on the eve of Mother's Day. In any of the shooting incidents we have seen so far in 2021, which are at our nearly 20-year high, up 86.5% since this time last year, it could have been any of us, or our children, or our parents, or our friends, who could have been struck. Bullets do not discriminate. And we, the NYPD, this city council, our state and federal legislators, and all of our law enforcement and community partners need to do much, much more to stem the violence. Members of the NYPD have made record numbers of gun arrests this year with fewer resources. But without meaningful consequences, existing laws are nothing more than an illusion. This pandemic has taken a toll on, literally, everyone across our city, our nation, and the world. At the NYPD, the coronavirus claimed the lives of 10 uniform members, 38 civilian members, and seven volunteer auxiliary members. Regardless of their rank, title, or role in the police department, those 55 family members of ours, whom we vow to never forget, died in service to New Yorkers. We at the NYPD see partners in those who control the budget. You share our responsibility to keep New Yorkers safe, and we're thankful for it. Our collective efforts are for all the people we serve, 8 million plus New Yorkers, and millions more who are increasingly coming back to their office spaces, and the millions more tourists who will be returning to experience all our great city has to offer. I know that our cultural institutions, our restaurants, our vibrant nightlife, and much more will roar back in time. But make no mistake, all of what, all what makes New York City great is built on the foundation of public safety that all of us provide. I'm heartened by the fact that at the end of last week, we graduated our first class of new police officers in nearly a year. That will certainly help. Every little bit does. But as you know, we lost nearly 1,200 cops in last year's budget, as well as significant funding for overtime that the police department has relied on for well over a decade to supplement staffing in locations where we see upticks in violence. Overtime is a critical tool in maintaining public safety because it affords us additional deployments in neighborhoods with increasing levels of shootings and other violence, including in the transit system, and in our many housing developments. While it enables detectives to fast track many cases that can lead to convictions, other investigations are very intensive and can continue for months, often with uncooperative victims or witnesses. Such cases need a lot of resources too, because great police work means relentless follow-up and not stopping until an arrest is made and justice is served. And I can also report that in the past year, the NYPD has spent less on overtime costs than at any time in at least the past 15 years. The bottom line is less overtime equals less cops during doing police work. It is that simple. This fiscal year continues to be unique and challenging. Uniformed overtime spending is down almost 40 percent, and the budget for next year's fiscal year has been cut to bring the police department down to our current fiscal year spend. I must note that we have been without hundreds of New York City events, big and small, that we would normally see. 
from the West Indian Day Parade, Carnival and Parade, to the National Puerto Rican Day Parade, to all the other events that celebrate the rich cultural, ethnic, and religious heritages that make New York the greatest city in the world. As we see these events return, the need for additional police officers will mean additional overtime expenditures. And our current overtime budget for next fiscal year, which is already underfunded based purely on our need to deploy officers to fight back the rise in violence, will even further potentially be insufficient to allow for adequate coverage at these events. In totality, the NYPD's fiscal 2022 expense budget is $5.4 billion, the vast majority of which, 92%, is allocated for personnel costs. The remaining 8% is dedicated to non-personnel costs, including technology that provides officers with immediate access to critical safety equipment, tools, and applications. As I mentioned earlier, last year's adopted budget saw significant operating reductions of $417 million, including a recruit class cancellation that diminished our uniform workforce by 1,163 officers, a uniformed overtime decrease, a civilian overtime decrease, the cutting of 100 civilian positions, a delay in police cadet hiring, and other non-personnel reductions. As part of the $563.9 million reduction to the NYPD's capital budget taken at adoption, funding was eliminated for the new 116th Precinct and its station house, as well as for construction of a much-needed consolidated property clerk warehouse that would improve evidence and property storage. As part of this most recent budget, $92 million in capital funding was restored for the construction of a new 116th Precinct Station House. This will be the second facility after the new 40th Precinct Station House, currently under construction, that will have a dedicated community space in which residents and workers from neighborhoods can engage directly with police officers who serve them. In summary, our neighborhood policing philosophy, a proven crime-fighting model of policing, works when we have the necessary tools and resources. That is how we balance public safety. When tools are taken away, there are real-world consequences on the streets in the form of increasing crime and victimization. Of course, that extends underground into our subway system, too, where quality of life conditions and whether riders feel safe are of paramount concern. And that's an important distinction. People need to be safe, but they also absolutely must feel safe, too. Cause and effect applies to our highways, parkways, and surface roads as well. I know I do not need to remind anyone that amid a spike in traffic-related deaths and injuries this year, Detective Anastasio Sacos, two weeks ago today, was struck and killed by a drunk driver with a suspended license as he helped secure the scene of an earlier fatal collision and investigation on the LIE in Queens. In all instances, it is imperative that the people who commit crimes take responsibility for their poor decisions. And it is vital that the criminal justice system as a whole ensures accountability. When I was sworn in by the mayor nearly a year and a half ago, I said that our renewed focus on our city's young people was part of our evolution as a police department and a city. Despite the headwinds over the past year, we are staying the course. And the NYPD, with the entire city's support, pledges again to redouble its efforts in this area. Just last week, I joined the mayor and elected officials at the Wagner Houses in East Harlem to open up new basketball courts where young New Yorkers and residents alike can exercise and play. The work we do must always be about sharing the responsibility for public safety, working together to reduce crime and violence. When these things happen together, we are building the bridge between the public safety and the public's trust. Post-pandemic, as we take neighborhood policing again to the next level by way of our reinvigorated youth strategy, I want to thank you for your ongoing partnership. More than ever, New Yorkers need even more all of our ideas and all of our actions. 
And that goes for the entire public safety spectrum, from traditional crime to terrorism to the seedbed activities that can draw young people down a path to criminality in the first place. This is our mission, and we owe every New Yorker nothing but our best efforts. Thank you again so much for the opportunity to testify this morning, and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, before we get started with questions, let me announce that we have been joined by council members Levin, Cabrera, Ayala, Moya, Rodenchik, and our uh, uh, majority leader, Lori Combo. Um, just bear with me one moment. Sure. So, Commissioner, in your testimony, um, you mentioned you spoke a lot about the overtime, and I have a lot of questions about the overtime. But do you think that the cut to overtime and headcount last year was wrong? I think in, in, in and I'll turn it to um, Christine, our budget director, in a second. I think in tough times, you have to make tough decisions, but you also have to have eyes wide open that they have consequences. Um, so we, we share the burden, as all city agencies do, at a time of incredible difficulty with what we all went through last year. Um, Christine, you, do you have anything to add to that or no? I, I would just second what you're saying. I mean, really difficult times. We all you know, know that every agency has to contribute. But you know, the this, this size of the cut you know, at 60 percent of our overtime budget was really quite significant. Uh, and you know, as the landscape has evolved over the year, we really had to focus on the critical areas where we need, as the commissioner said, overtime is used to enable us to have additional deployment. So as conditions have evolved on the ground, we have had to um, continue to utilize overtime resources. And you know, that budget cut brought us to a historic low. You know, we haven't seen a level that low in at least 15 years. But do you, have you ever thought that you might not need as many police to police some of these situations and protests? I mean, last year's protest and the response by the NYPD was a disaster. I mean, all of the beatings and, and, and all of the, um, uh, the um, DOI investigation showed us that uh, we may not need as many police at these situations. I, I mean, I, I think there's a major disconnect here. Uh, you know, and when you talk about safety, I think that, you know, you have to have uh, the public's attitude and mindset as well. I, I don't feel safe oftentimes around police officers because of what I see and what I see happen. So I think we have to take a real good look at what's going on with the overtime. Uh, and that's not because of us, that's because of the department. Uh, the department's fiscal 21 overtime budget is $272 million as of the executive plan. However, expenditures already exceeded the budget by 75 million with two months to go in the fiscal year. By the end of the fiscal year, actual expenditures may exceed the budget by $100 million, which would be almost 40% over the budget. Why has NYPD not been able to stay within its budget? So to several points you raised, I mean, to, to the point about the beatings, that's just factually inaccurate. To the, to the point about you not feeling safe, I, I feel so. Yes, sir. Well, I'm trying to answer your question. Right. I just want to respond. Um, I saw what we saw on TV. I saw people being pushed to the ground. I saw people's heads being cracked open. So please don't deny that. That's, that's what we saw. Okay. And you're so under oath. You are under oath. So please answer questions honestly. To, to your point about you not feeling safe, uh, uh, clearly we have more work to do then, and I feel sorry for that. But I will tell you that that is not what I hear in neighborhoods across the city. Um, do I hear that at, at times? Have I heard that before? I have. I have. And that's why we are so dedicated across my entire executive staff to, to policing appropriately, constitutionally, and with the community. And I think we've made great strides in that but clearly more work to do. But I will tell you that your opinion, which I respect, is not the majority opinion that I hear across uh, various uh, neighborhoods across New York City. They love their police. 
They participate in events with their police. They know how much the police is there for them. And it heartens me, and I'm awfully proud of it. To the, to the questions about the overtime specifically, um, I, I think Christine touched on it, and I touched on it in some of the openings, too. We, we share the burden that all city agencies do at a very difficult time. Clearly, that has had an impact on, on our deployment strategies. That's just a fact of life, and we, we understand that. Uh, we, we would point out that while we were over budget for the budget that was set, we have done significant efforts across the department, and Christine can detail them at length in terms of cutting and streamlining processes. And I think it bears repeating that we are at a 15-year low at a minimum of how much we have spent in New York City. And what you did not mention is it is at a time that there are many factors going on at one point that we are called on to do many of very things, and it is at a time when there is also the lowest incarceration levels that has an impact, frankly, on crime, which we are seeing play out with a 100% increase in shootings. So you cannot look at one stagnant fact and ignore all the others. But we will continue there are more to control people, the overtime, sir. There are more people on Rikers Island today, 5,700 or so, than there were last year, 3,000. Your personnel is at an all-time high or all close to an all-time high in terms of the numbers of police in the department, but you're not able to control your overtime budget. What, why should we believe that you'll stick to your overtime budget this time around? You have not given me a clear answer. Well, I, I, I have given you an answer, and you... you yeah, but not a clear answer. You commitment. speak of... And, Sir, and you the, speak of the Rikers me. population, excuse but me, you didn't speak of the jail excuse population. Excuse me, Commissioner. Commissioner, yes, we're questioning you, and we are in charge of oversight over you and your budget. I need you to respond in that fashion and not try to take control. Do you agree to that? Yes, I agree. That okay. I answer Thank when a question is asked. Thank you. You're absolutely Thank you, right. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. So you have not been able to stick to your budget, Commissioner. Your job is to stick to your budget. What are you going to do this time around to stick to your budget? You agreed to the budget. You blew it. Are you going to blow it again? Let me just say, Council Member, if, if my officers spoke to the public this way, I would fire them. I think it's completely disrespectful to, to have a, a, a showmanship. Let's have an honest conversation and a back and forth where we can actually accomplish something rather than what you're trying to do. The people of New York City it, deserve better. Commissioner, I find it hard to believe a lot, a lot of what you say. Okay, you still have not produced any reason or any correlation between the change of laws, and I hear you on television all the time about bail reform and the correlation between the increase of crime. It seems to me that you're scapegoating things, and, and that is not acceptable. I'm sorry, it's just not acceptable. I'm going to move on here, but um, at this point, um, you know, you, you need to answer these questions honestly, Commissioner. If you, uh, it's just not I'll right. answer any question you have, sir. I'd be okay. glad to. All right, Commissioner. Um, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I've lost. I'm going to move. I'm going to um, go to uh, Council Member Adams at this point and allow her to ask questions, and I'll come back to you. Great. Thank you, Council Member Drum. And um, I can appreciate your frustration. Uh, the button is extreme. We've got a lot to answer for, and I'm sure, Commissioner, that you will certainly agree with that fact. So, I do. Uh, Commissioner, do you believe, do you actually believe that increases in crime were uh, a result of either not having enough officers or enough overtime? Is that what we're hearing? I think it's, uh, Council Member, um, I, I think it's one of many factors. Um, I don't think it's easy to put fingers on. Certainly the level of budget, but it, listen, this is, this is about a budget hearing and, and this police department of which I am in charge of. And it is your job to hold me accountable, and I respect that. And we got to do a good job on our end of utilizing our resources to the best ability to keep New Yorkers safe. And that's what New Yorkers demand and expect. And I agree with all of that. Certainly there's been challenges this last year with some of the crime issues protest issues and other things that have had an impact 
on, pro t on, on overtime spending. Um, we respect the budget that is issued, but certainly, it ha in my opinion, it has an impact on how we can deploy resources and where. Um, and then there are unforeseen circumstances that come up throughout the year as well. Um, and we manage all that. I am, I am um, proud of the fact that we have come in, at, you know, as I've said now a couple times, at, at at least a 15 year low. We have cut significant amounts of overtime. Um, not as much as we would have liked to, but that's a fact. We've cut significant amounts of overtime. Uh, and it remains a challenge. And we're going to look to do more where we can uh, to impact public safety with the least uh, negative impact. Uh, oh, okay. Christine, do you uh, have, have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add that, you know, while we are spending above uh, the reduced budget level, it is still a 30% decrease. The spending we're projecting for the full year is projected to be 30% lower than the budget before the cuts. And with regard to the headcount, we're, we're not at our highest headcount level. We took a headcount reduction uh, at adoption of 1163, and that overtime reduction translates into, on average, having 1,500 fewer officers available uh, than we otherwise would have with that overtime. And that overtime is where we have had to, to spend is focused on investigations, focused on our operational overtime where we're ensuring uninterrupted provision of emergency services and maintaining minimum staffing at our precincts in transit and housing areas, and as the commissioner said, focusing on crime reduction. So while it is true that we are over the budget, this is a significant reduction in spending from what we have seen historically. Okay, so we are okay, let's, let, let's stay there. Let's stay there. Now, let's look at this. We're talking about the budget. We're talking about, about where the budget lands. There are 375 positions that you've identified as potential for civilianization. That means 375 uniform officers are performing civilian duties and unable to fill their uniform duties. So your headcount is at about 16,000, I believe, and you should be able to use your civilian staff efficiently so you can get the uniform officers back to uniform duties. Can you explain why those uniform officers are still performing civilian duties when the responsibility should be handled by non-uniform police administrative aides? Uh, I'll start it. I think the peak civilian headcount at one point was 20,000. We're down to, I think you're right, Councilwoman Adams, uh, 16 or 17,000 right now. Um, civilianization has been a... a uh, a goal not only of the city council but of me personally for many years. We have done a lot of work towards civilianization, moving full duty police officers out of administrative positions. We're doing it again this summer on a temporary basis for all out to put them in neighborhoods that uh, are asking for more police officers to fight some of the crime. I agree with what you said um, in terms of um, you know, challenges, Christine can go into what we've already done to um, move some of those officers out onto the street. Yeah, so the civilianization that has been done to date, and we've made every effort to identify where, with additional civilian resources, we can uh, deploy officers back out into the field. It just, while our, you know, while our civilian headcount is, with our um, part-time, over 17,000, Almost 11,000 of those are, are safety titles. So they're civilians like our 911 call takers and supervisors, our traffic enforcement agents, our criminalists, our crime analysts, and our school crossing guards. So once you've removed that, it's, it's really the, the focus was to identify, again, you're also operating a 24-7 operation. So with every position you have that you've identified that can be civilianized, you really have to look at whether or not uh, you have a civilian who can cover that on three tours a day. Uh, so it's not sort of a one-for-one -one, uh, situation. So we continue to look at this, and it's something we've continued to have conversations with, with the Office of Management and Budget about future civilianization opportunities. But with the fiscal condition as it's been, it's, it's been a little difficult. So we do prioritize where we can within our existing headcount, but a large portion of our existing headcount are actually civilian safety titles, which cannot be... Um, redeployed uh, to cover these positions. Uh, I just think that those efforts need to be significantly ramped up. I, I think there's a lot 
of money that we are looking at that can be brought over that we and I really, really think that we need to get more serious about um, uniformed officers, their responsibilities in uniform, uh, and, and placing police administrative aides in their rightful positions where they belong. I, I don't, I, I simply don't know uh, the extreme difficulty um, in doing that, but I appreciate your response. Um, let's just take a look at the protest uh, for a minute. The NYPD spent $170 million responding to the George Floyd protests. And that's just time. Here we are in overtime again. What other expenses did the NYPD incur as a result of the protests? So, I mean, the, the, there were other um, uh, very small amounts in um, other than personal services to make sure that we had officers had, um, you know, fire extinguishers that they needed uh, in the vehicles, uh, also uh, addressing um, uh, any other equipment that was needed, and uh, ultimately uh, some vehicles uh, were damaged and needed to be fixed, uh, so resources for that, but uh, that was just uh, one or two million dollars overall. The primary expenditures were the overtime. Okay. Um, in, in staying with the protest situation, Commissioner, I found it interesting that you just said to our chair that you would fire uh, your officers for speaking disrespectfully. How many officers were fired for their, for their behavior during those protests? And how many orders have been given on banning the unacceptable practice known as kettling? Well, let me just start out, and I'm going to turn to Ben Tucker, our first deputy commissioner. Um, Councilwoman Adams, I appreciate greatly your opening remarks uh, about the discipline, about the work of the council about the work of all that we have uh, together done to kind of move the city and the department forward in these areas. I'm seeing a lot of positive news already. Um, ben and I were speaking earlier today in anticipation for these council hearings on the subject of divergence of CCRB, uh, on the subject of um, the discipline matrix and how is it having an impact on how we mete out punishment. When you look at the first four plus months of this year, I am very happy to report that we have had four occurrences, four, where we have had a different penalty meted out than the one prescribed by CCRB coming to my office. In one of those four occurrences, I looked at the penalty that was recommended and upped the penalty, meaning I meted out more than was requested by CCRB. Was anyone fired? No, they were not. The, in the other three of the four circumstances, uh, the person was found either partially or fully not guilty after a trial, and that was the reason for. So we have done a lot of work, and it is in partnership with the council and other stakeholders. We heard this through the reform initiative, and we think we're seeing uh, a lot of positives on this, mm -hmm. where everyone has the playing field. It's a level playing field, whether it's the police whether it's the victims of these complaints or, or, or the entire process. And that's, that's a positive that I think everyone should be proud of. Ben, anything? Well, yeah, I would add that uh, when it comes to terminations this year, we, we have at least three uh, that I can point to uh, where either these officers were scheduled for trial um, and, and those, uh, the presumptive penalty at the end of those trials would have been termination, but in fact, uh, the officers uh, stepped out, uh, retired before, uh, decided to leave the department. Uh, prior to, in, in some, in one case, just one day before the trial was scheduled to take place, and so even though we talk about terminations, uh, very often we'll we'll have officers leave under a different circumstance where where we have them vest. Uh, because as a matter of course, it makes more sense, it's more practical, and they'll negotiate and take the vest and leave. Because the goal is to get that particular officer uh, out of the department uh, as quickly as possible. But we're not bashful about terminating officers, um, and you can see that in the, in the matrix uh, and even before. But now, uh, when you look at uh, the matrix and you examine uh, the number of, of cases and uh, uh, presumptive penalties that, that uh, begin with, termination, uh, you can, I think, understand that when it comes to transparency and what the intent of the, uh, the panel, uh, that uh, the disciplinary panel that we convened uh, several years back, uh, and their 13 recommendations, one of which 
was specifically focused on uh, this notion of, of being more transparent, but also uh, getting to a point where uh, precedent doesn't drive what we do, but rather the facts drive what we do and the punishment fitting the crime, so to speak. And so we are there now. And uh, as we have begun to use the matrix, uh, we will see um, as this plays out uh, over the next several months, as we get used to using it both, uh, both uh, here in the department, but also uh, I, there's an expectation that CCRB will get better at um, uh, using the matrix as a tool as it is intended to be. Councilmember Adams, may I interject for a moment? Are you actually saying that you hired one person out of 36,000 people? I'm sorry? Are you saying that you fired one person, one police officer out of 36,000 police officers? I said we terminated at least three officers. Three, okay, three. Uh, Three out of thirty-six thousand, and that's acceptable. Well, yeah, they're, 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 yeah, out of thirty-six thousand. Okay, that's acceptable. This, this period Thank of you. Time. That's, I just wanted to know if it was acceptable. Thank you. Okay, I don't find that to be acceptable, and we still haven't gotten an answer about the officers that were involved in the incidents with the George Floyd protest. Have any of them been fired? The, the disciplinary process is ongoing. Uh, and have they, they been removed from duty? Some have, some have. How many? I don't have the number in front of me. Of course you don't. Okay, thank you, Council Member Adams. You may resume. You, you actually asked the question, you just pulled it right out of my brain. I was looking for numbers, so I was actually going there, uh, Chair Drew. So uh, we're on the same wavelength with that. And uh, I guess for both of us, the response was not uh, particularly acceptable when it comes to the protests, when it comes to the, um, the level um, of egregious behavior. Uh, that was displayed again that we all saw, and yet we see no, uh, no, no, no punishment for this. Um, it's almost a year later now. We're going into into a year uh, where these instances have happened, and we're hearing that the process is still ongoing, and that's extremely disturbing. Um, well, perhaps, I can let me just say that the process is ongoing for for lots of reasons. A number of these cases will come through CCRB. Um, and then as they reach our department advocate's office, then they'll be dealt with at that point. I could ask Amy uh, to, to step in and just speak a, a bit about what, what the status I'd is. I'd love to hear a timeline. I, I would really love to hear a timeline. Councilwoman Adams, if I could too, and I don't know if Amy can jump in, but um, you know, we, we had officers, officer in Brooklyn that was arrested. We had an officer during that same period, time period in Queens that was arrested. Those cases are ongoing. We had officers that were suspended. We had officers that were modified. All of those were taken off the street. And then we have a number of civilian complaint review board cases that are working its way through the civilian complaint review board. Um, the timeline is not as easily obtained uh, in more detail than that. I apologize for that. But there is a, depending on what the offenses were in these number of cases, then the timelines are different. And then, you know, we, we had officers that were exonerated as well. Not every incident of using force was uh, misconduct. So there was, um, you know, the, as we all know, there was a lot going on in that period. Uh, the important thing, again, I apologize for not having a clear answer that you can um, grasp that is sufficient to you now, but uh, please know that we are taking it very seriously, and both us, the, the two prosecutors that I mentioned, as well as the Civilian Complaint Review Board, all those processes are underway. Amy, do you have anything that you could add? Yeah, I would just add a couple of things. Um, I would add something just in terms of terminations and officers that are separated from the department. And I'll also just add something about the protest related cases that we're waiting on from CCRB. Um, in terms of separations from the department, um, you know, we looked at some numbers and just under police commissioner Shea's tenure, a total of 54 officers have been separated from the department. Those are four separations as a result of a disciplinary matter. Those include terminations. Um, those include officers dismissed due to misconduct while they were on dismissal probation. And the one thing that that number doesn't account for is the number of officers who resign or separate from the department while discipline is pending. It is not uncommon when we have a very serious case or termination type case that an officer will resign depending on which 
which pension they're in, we can't prevent them from doing so. There are circumstances where someone attempts to, to leave the department and we still can try them with a department trial and we will still terminate them even though they are trying to leave. So that 54 number does not account for 83 additional um, uniform members of service who also uh, resigned or separated from the department prior to the resolution of their disciplinary matter or their, their trial or a plea. Um, and they resigned they resign with the full pension, right? Um, not necessarily, uh, no. Yeah. Well, how um, you can get a pension? If someone resigns, um, they are forfeiting um, certain things that they would normally have been entitled how many? to. So the, I, I know that there were, like I said, there were 83. I don't have a breakdown in terms of which tier they were in. As I mentioned, if a police officer is in a tier three, um, there is nothing that we can do to prevent that officer from putting their papers in and leaving the department. If they are not in tier three, actually I can speak from experience, we will move a case forward. We have 30 days before someone's uh, attempt to retire is solidified and we will take that to trial. And we've had a number of cases where we've tried those cases and where we have terminated members uh, prior to their ability to obtain their pension in that, that within that 30 day period. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to point out, because I know there's a lot of discussion about protest related cases. And um, as of yesterday, I looked at the numbers in terms of our intake from CCRB. We have received so far to date, according to our records, a total of 23 cases. Um, that's 22 respondents uh, that we've categorized as, and CCRB has categorized as protest related cases. Of those cases, only eight of those cases deal with use of force or unlawful arrest. Um, actually, a majority of the cases, approximately 12 of those cases, dealt with um, a particular protest where uh, there was someone at the protest who walked around the protest and filmed officers who had uh, a mourning band covering their name or their shield. So that fell within the category of what CCRB has sent us so far in terms of protest related cases. So that was 12 cases where it was difficult to identify an officer's name or shield. And as I mentioned, there were eight that included um, excessive force. And this is as of our, uh, as of our reporting um, yesterday. I think we've received approximately three additional cases that have not yet been inputted into our database. I think one of those also involved use of force. So there are, you know, I know that CCRB has stated that there's a number of cases that they have, hundreds perhaps related to the protests. I can only tell you that we can only process them as quickly as they send them to us. This is, the, this is what we've seen from them so far, and we are still awaiting any additional cases that are related to the protests that they have to send us. So thank you for that. So previously, NYPD has had uh, settlements of about $240 million in settlements. How much do you expect to pay out? Ernie or Christine? We've had, it's hard to predict what we expect to pay out. However, um, there has been a decrease um, from looking at fiscal year 2020, a decrease of 13.5% in the total number of lawsuits. And as far as the amount of money paid out as of uh, Total payouts for NYPD decreased from by 7% from fiscal year 18 and 35% from fiscal year 17. So it's, don't know what, uh, with uh, litigation uh, cases down, um, it should have a significant uh, positive effect on the amount of money that's paid out. Yeah, but it went down because of the pandemic. That's, that's obvious, but uh, the, the payouts, uh, you, you don't know or can't project the payouts for 2021. And I'm, I'm really looking at more, uh, you know, the lawsuits with regard to the protests in particular. I, I also but, need to know whether or not kettling is a banned practice right now. But for a councilman, but lawsuits, lawsuits have gone down every year, including um, yes. notwithstanding uh, COVID. So, all right. Yeah, and, and you know, I'll, I'll jump in, and I don't know if Ben wants to jump in as well. Uh, we take that, I think that's a really important question you raised, Councilwoman. Uh, we take it very seriously. It's, 
It speaks to the heart of the training that we, you know, put our officers through. It speaks to the Risk Management Bureau that we, we stood up a number of years ago. I think the positive here is that, as Commissioner Hart said, we've seen an overall declining of lawsuits. Ernie, tell me if I'm saying it wrong, but of lawsuits against members of the NYPD, not just from the COVID year, for a period of years. Um, it's, a, it's a little difficult to determine how the protests of last year will impact on that, but it's something we take very, very seriously. Yeah, and I, I would just add, just to, to, to the commissioner's point and to Ernie's point about the, the lawsuits going down, risk, risk, we, we can't underestimate uh, the, the, the work that the Risk Management Bureau does. I mean, as you may know, they, they work with uh, the monitor that is our principal contact with, with the federal monitor on the stop and frisk litigation. But, but more importantly than that, I think, or beyond that, is the work that we do on early intervention, the work that we do on as we move to uh, increased training around bias and other areas, uh, all of that training gets tested and we do look at individual offices uh, a lot better and a lot more effectively than we have been able to do in the past uh, because we have better data. And so all of that I think has a cumulative effect of reducing uh, the number of, uh, of incidents or the, the nature of the conduct that officers might be engaged in that might result in, in litigation. So I think there's a, when you look at this, it's not, not just one particular uh, uh, issue that impacts uh, the, the decrease in, uh, in, these, in these actions, but it has to do with ongoing uh, scrutiny, uh, paying attention to uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the work that the office is doing on the street, how they're doing it, looking at supervision, uh, focusing on accountability, all of those things are part of the way in which, and also the discipline cases that, that come up uh, in the, uh, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis that, um, that might ultimately result in, in, um, in litigation. Many do not, um, and so, but the fact that they do not uh, suggests to us at least that, that, that some of what we're doing, the work that we do through intervention uh, uh, and the risk management uh, process is being uh, is is is, uh, is is effective. Can I can I also say one more thing? Um, from fiscal year 13 to fiscal year 20, the number of filings has gone down 55 percent. Uh, 4,050 in fiscal year 13 and 1,820 in fiscal year 20. So again, it's just evidence of the the continuous decrease in lawsuits against the department. Thank you. Did I, did I get an answer? I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Drum. I've got to run to a vote real quick and land use, then I'm going to come right back. Did we get an answer to the kettling question? There is no kettling. Um, I'll let Juanita, if you're on too, you can, or Rodney, you want to talk on this? But kettling has never been something that has been taught or allowed within the New York City Police Department, Councilwoman. Rodney, you want to jump in? What's the penalty for it? Anybody fired for, I, no, nobody's fired for that either then, right? Council member, uh, one thing I, I just want to share with you is uh, the kettling has never been part of the of the training that the NYPD has utilized. Um, have there been mistakes that might have resulted in uh, some type of form or fashion of that? You know, we'll, we'll be very transparent and say, yeah, we, we, we might have made mistakes. Um, it's a training uh, mechanism that we have in place with either our strategic response group or our um, mobile field forces that respond to some of these peaceful protests. Um, unfortunately, if it gets to a point where there's a, a violent demonstration that turns out of it, and unfortunately those things do happen, um, we may have to, have to say surround certain individuals, uh, unfortunately, just to make sure that none of our police officers get hurt. But regarding the discipline, I don't have that response in front of me right now. Um, but I will say that that is not a strategy that we do regarding protests throughout the city. Okay, I, 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 I will vehemently, uh object to what you just said and I will let uh, Chair Drum jump in here. Yeah, and I have to uh, uh, agree with you, uh, uh, Chair Adams, as well. I've been a victim of it. I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, it happened when they did the uh, Matthew Shepard protest. They kettled us in between uh, uh, 6th and 7th Avenue and they brought horses in and they uh, stampeded the horses all over the people while we were kettled in. Uh, so it's just bizarre that we're even having these types of discussions. 
um, with the NYPD and, and just not acknowledging the reality of what exists. It's, it's bizarre. So I uh, can, um, if you allow me to, um, Councilman, I can speak to... Uh, Chief Holmes, Chief Holmes. Hi, so to say the least, uh, it, is some, it is not something we have trained to. I'm not going to say that people didn't feel a victim of it uh, because if you felt that way and you're aware of it, then obviously at some point it was happening. What we've learned from that is this. Uh, when we have danger ahead of certain locations and we're blocking people off from whether it's a fire that was started, whether it's an arrest that's being made, we had to communicate better or should have communicated better. Listen, you're free to take the other route and continue your protest, you know, if there was a route available. But the reason for us not allowing you to go any further is because danger's ahead. So I'm not making excuses or saying that was the case all the time. But what I will say is I've been here 30 something years minus my one year in private sector. Never have I heard that word or never have I seen the department trained to it. But it doesn't mean people didn't feel victim to it or that it didn't occur. What I'm saying is now moving forward, protests have gotten a lot better, a lot of less arrests have been made, community affairs is there out front handling that and there's communication. You know, anytime we have to communicate, listen, there's a fire, there's an arrest being made for a particular reason, but you're free to continue your protest. But can you please go this way or at least allow us the time to get whatever's ahead under control? Chief Holmes, that wasn't the case in my instance and in many other people's experiences. There was no danger involved, but that's what the police department chose to do. Granted, it was many years ago, but to say that, to deny my lived experience with this is just not right. And that is exactly the problem with the police department. Uh, I'm glad that you're owning up to it somewhat, but this is the experiences that people have had with the police mm -hmm. department. So uh, anyway, I wanna move on. The point has been made, we're not happy. I'm not happy. Many people in the city are not happy with the fashion in which the leadership here has led this department. Uh, let me talk about another failure. That's with the school safety agents. Another component of last year's budget agreement was the transfer of school safety to DOE. We understand that this shift will take time, but the financial plan details spending through fiscal 2025, and no money has been added or moved in any year of the plan to reflect this shift. I mentioned this in my opening. Um, when do you expect the transfer of this function out of NYPD to be finalized, and how is NYPD working with DOE to transfer these functions? Council member, uh, Councilman, thank you for the question. It's a really important issue. Um, when we were notified of that last year at the budget, we began, as well as our partners, specifically the DOE, uh, members at City Hall, and immediate planning for that um, transfer to happen. I think Chief Holmes was probably assigned to uh, school safety at the time, if my memory serves me right, and she probably took part in some of that. And currently it's spearheaded uh, I'll turn it to Ch uh, Chief Obey, Lola Obey, who's on this call, that can tell you where we are right now. But I can tell you that um, the planning, and it is going to be a complicated process, but we are 100% committed to it, and it's underway. Lola, are you on? Yes, sir, I'm on. Um, good, after, good morning, everyone. So we started conversations with the DOE in November of 20, um, 2020. Right now, we're on pace. Um, we've been... Um, advised by the DOE that uh, the transition should happen by uh, June of 2022. There's a lot of progress. Um, we had issues with data transfer so far. We had the uh, legal uh, team from the PD and the DOE end get together. Uh, right now we have a data share agreement in place. Uh, we're also working with the ITB folks from both ends, PD and the DOE uh, to get that going. So that's where we are with the transition. Um, and we also have a number of uh, committees that meet weekly just to give, um, you know, just to um, get a sense of uh, the progress and where we are. So there is the community engagement team, uh, the data the data uh, trans, uh, data sharing team. Um, and um, so that's where we are for the most part. It is ongoing. I know that you don't see a lot of it out, uh, but we are talking uh, to the, uh, the DOE and uh, the uh, transition is moving forward. Okay, thank you. And when can we expect to see the movement of the money? Christine? So, 
again, this is on a has always been meant to be a two-year process. We want to make sure we get everything set and right before the technical transfer happens. Um, the specific timing of which financial plan that'll be in that'll ultimately be up to the Office of Management and Budget. But as the chief said, we are actively working on this transition with DOE and various parts of both agencies to move this forward to make sure it happens smoothly on that two-year timeline. So this is the second year of the agreement. And we're moving into fiscal 22. Are you saying that we can expect to see this at adoption? I, I can't speak to specifically when it'll be in, but I'm sure the Office of Management and Budget can provide uh, more detail on the exact timing. Well, who is controlling the uh, decision to make uh, to, to change that funding? Isn't that working? your department? We work in concert with the Office of Management and Budget because this is involving the budgets of two agencies, both right. ours so and you, the Department of Education. Have you, had, have you had discussions with OMB? We have ongoing discussions with OMB. I don't have the exact which financial plan the transition will happen, and they are so, better uh, positioned to speak to that. And what were those discussions within OMB involved? What did they involve? They involve all of the details that the chief just spoke about. They're involved in this process in terms of the operations, identifying the resources that we have in the department here that will be transferred over and the uh, funding that goes along with that, what the various titles and positions do, what role they play here. And I'm sure on the other side, conversations in parallel happening on what role they'll play at the Department of Education. Well, this answer is not sufficient. We need to know more about when those funds will be transferred. And uh, we hope that you will uh, engage OMB in those discussions as well. Seems like you haven't actually had that discussion with them. Does you, do you have any plans to hire any new school safety agents? We've also been speaking with OMB and the mayor's office about that, but no decision has been, no final decision has been made on those hires at this time. Any of those hires would be to replace attrition uh, we are down about 500 school safety agents at this time. So will you have an answer for us by adoption? We will continue to have those conversations with mayor's office and the mayor's office of management and budget. To try again, to you're it. refusing, again, you're refusing to answer. Yes, we will work with OMB and the mayor's office to get you an answer. When will you have the answer? It'll base, be based on those conversations with those entities. Will you have the answer by adoption? It involves other parties, so we'll all work together. That would be the goal. I just want to know when you will have the answer. The goal will be to have the answer if, by Listen, adoption. you were brought in to answer questions to the oversight I, body that has oversight over your department. Sir, with all respect, I did just answer, answer the question. Me, when, excuse me. When will you have the answer? I, as Christine said, she is working with OMB. There are multiple partners involved. What we are focused on here is... If there are additional people that have to be hired for the safety of students, then those decisions will be made in partnership with all the, the DOE, us, and OMB. And really, it's irrelevant where the budget money comes from. We're worried about the safety of the kids. And if it subsequently, as planned, transfers over to DOE, then we'll make those decisions at that time as well. Commissioner, we don't want to know a week before or two days Understood. before, or at adoption itself, exactly, whether you're making a decision to hire 400 or so new school safety agents. Um, and then we do not have time to um, discuss that with you uh, and, and to That's share our concerns with you about that. So this is a tactic that we don't do, we do not appreciate. We need I, to know I, well before. I understand that and I agree with you. Thank you. And we are working with OMB on that. Thank you. Okay, let's go to council member questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum. So if any council members have questions for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers, and please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. And the Sergeant will also let you know when your time is up. Um, we will first hear questions from Public Advocate Williams, followed by Council Member Landers. Your time will begin. Can somebody uh, unmute the Public Advocate, yeah. please? I think I'm good now. Can everybody hear me? 
Hey, okay. Thank yes, sir. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair Drum, uh, Chair Adams, Commissioner, and the NYPD. Um, you know, I have uh, family and friends who are in law enforcement. And so I always remember that with any comments I make. And I always remember that if something happened right now and there was danger, uh, most folks would expect that those men and women run toward the danger while we run away. And so I never leave my mind. Uh, I have unfortunately been hearing people pushing a binary uh, discussion between more police and no law enforcement at all. Uh, and unfortunately, there's some that, uh, particularly with the former, uh, specialized uh, in pushing that narrative uh, when instances are in where gun violence is up. They specialize in stoking fear. Uh, but I also remember uh, that they have the same line of reasoning whether the violence is up or violence is down. In fact, they said the same things when we were at historic lows. Uh, even worse, I think for me, are those who think they provide leadership by saying the answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, I just want to be emphatically clear that it is not. The answer is not somewhere in the middle. And we've been failing to ask the right questions and have the right discussion for too long. The answer is in finally implementing a public safety plan that reflects what after many years people are finally beginning to say, which is police is not synonymous with public safety. The answer is funding and resourcing all of the partners and all of the things that we say actually provide public safety as a partner in coordination with law enforcement to have all the play. What we've heard is a lot of words uh, around this, but not the action Unfortunately, suicides are up. Uh, violence is up. We expected and knew that this would happen. When I testified in DYCD, I talked about the young man, a 13 year old who committed suicide. The day after, there was a young man, 12 year old, who died from bullying. The day of Times Square, uh, uh, there was a birthday party that was shot up in Colorado. In Miami, there was another shooting. Gun violence is up across the country, so was suicide, as I mentioned. It is not because of New York State's bail reform. It is not because NYPD has been defunded. And it pains me to see people who actually know that the NYPD has not been defunded, especially in relation to other, uh, um, other departments, either by silence or actually pretending that it has. It is not helpful to the conversation. We cut 35,000 youth jobs last year. The department was the only or one of only to actually get new hires to replenish attrition that every agency had. It's frustrating because we failed and we're now reaping the failure with violence going on. Can you imagine other departments, other professions that have access to the type of overtime that police have? Police are not the only ones who need overtime or those type of resources. I spread in the city uh, just the other day the fact that even though Thrive has spent over a billion dollars, the conversion centers are either not built or empty. And we will continue to send police department to the subways to deal with mentally ill people instead of getting those conversion centers up. By the way, crime in the subways is down April over April, even though we have a lot more work to do. The problem is we keep continuing to say that police are the primary reason that we're safe and we have to do everything to make sure that they are funded to the max, even while other people, even a discussion about changing the way we look at school safety agents, not firing people, but just changing the way we, we, we talk about it and we look at it. It lists all kinds of crazy. We can't go on like we were at unsustainable lows of gun violence and murders just before the pandemic. We knew there was going to be an uptick at some point because we weren't sure that we'd be able to sustain. The decrease in crime happened while we went from almost 20,000 in Rikers to now about 5,000. The police, give or take a thousand up or down, have remained primarily the same. In that time, stops went down, arrests went down, use of force went down, all of those things went down. We know it can be done. It has been done. We did it. The NYPD, I hope, can focus more on gun trafficking, just the same way they did on terrorism. That was a federal issue. 
let's give our law enforcement the focus where they need to focus. And yes, they have, I mean, I don't know if anybody has ever seen a square footage where their police are inundated. That's not the community we want. No one says that they want to live in a community where every square block and inch we can have is fit with police and police force. It doesn't feel like time. Thank you so much. I just want to say we have been asking and answering the wrong questions, and we're paying the price for that. We all have partnership to play, and I really hope we can get this right in this budget as we're increasing the chief of the department with increasing SSA, but there's no increase in the SBS budget for job, job training and job centers. I really hope we can get this right sometime because uh, people are dying. They really are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Councilmember Lander, followed by Councilmember Rodriguez. The time will begin. Thank you to both chairs uh, and Commissioner. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to start by associating myself with the words of the public advocate on what we're looking at and what we're not looking at and what kind of leadership we need to bring us together to confront real problems. During the preliminary budget hearing, uh, we identified the fact that last year's NYPD budget, when we accounted for the overtime overspending, had been reduced by about $240 million from the previous year. Uh, this year, at this point, we're, uh, an increase is proposed of over $200 million. So we're basically at the same place we were budget size pre-pandemic. So it is just not helpful to lay the increase in crime on budget cuts that were not made, that we're not seeing. Um, and I guess I also want to say in response to what Chair Drum said about kettling, the public advocate and I were kettled together on multiple occasions in June on Washington Avenue on one evening and Grand Army Plaza in another evening where there was no effort to direct people in a safer or different direction. There was a kettling approach to end a protest. And that happened, it was on video on multiple occasions. But I wanna start with a budget question just because it's something that I was trying to find in the budget and could not see. Um, uh, for many years, the Police Foundation has funded millions of dollars annually toward the NYPD's budget, covering expenses ranging from surveillance technologies to public relations initiatives, uh, not subject to public oversight, and the NYPD has resisted transparency related to Police Foundation donations. So as a result, uh, last year, the Council included a term and condition in the FY21 adopted budget requiring the NYPD to submit a report on private funding sources and the expenditures from such sources. Um, the report that the NYPD submitted to the Council this year doesn't list any monies from the Police Foundation, zero. So is that accurate? Was there actually zero money from the Police Foundation this year? If not, how much uh, was funded? How much more is expected? And why wasn't this listed in the report pursuant to the term and condition? So I, I can speak to that. Uh, the foundation's funding, it's a, it's, a, it's a private entity, as you indicated. Uh, the funding does not flow through the NYPD's budget. So the term and condition, uh, we provided the information and the budget lines related to expenditures that are made by the police department directly using funds from private entities. Um, but there are no budget lines related to expenditures from the foundation because the NYPD isn't making those expenditures. Uh, you pointed out some of the things the foundation does support uh, the city and the department with. Um, those things also include rewards paid, paid out for tips for Crime Stoppers, Operation Gun Stop. They've assisted um, in person. Hang on, if you're not going to provide us the report with the information on where the money's coming from and where it's going to, I'm not going to let you take credit for it in this hearing. Will you provide us with the information on the sources and uses of that money? It sounds like you're planning to continue to keep it confidential and not provide it to us, uh, which I believe is a violation of the terms and conditions. Um, it was clearly intended uh, to get that information provided, but it sounds like you're saying you're going to continue to refuse to do so. The, the foundation provides an annual report as a nonprofit. The expenditures are not made by the police department. I understand the expenses are not made by the police department. It's an off book effort where you get money and you and it's, it's spent at the direction of the police department. The commissioner decides how it's gonna be spent. It goes uh, alongside NYPD spending. So it, I'm gonna take that as an answer that we're not gonna get it, which is disappointing because that was the point of the term and condition. Um, the other question that I wanna ask here is in three areas where headcount is growing, 
Um, they're all areas where the department is, is saying it's pursuing alternative approaches. So there's uh, 23 positions proposed to add to the co-response mental health teams, NYPD uniformed officers, in neighborhood policing, there's 216 new civilian positions being added. And in school safety, although we can't get a clear answer, there's $4 million more added in this year's budget. So I'm gonna assume that there is a plan to actually hire new school safety agents, even though we asked at the preliminary budget and we're told we'd know by the executive budget. And now we're told maybe someone will tell us by the time we're asked to adopt it. But in each case, it seems like alternative approaches don't mean less policing they actually mean more policing. So that's what the budget says to me. Um, am I missing something? So on the school safety piece, the uh, additional resources there, they're not additional resources. That's uh, the fiscal year 22 budget um, does not have the same. Uh, there was some overtime reduction that we were able to take in the current year because of fewer events uh, and fewer school safe, less school safety overtime. Um, and with the um, schools opening up again, uh, that funding uh, is back in the budget uh, in 22 and out. Uh, and the positions that you're speaking about are uh, directly tied to the department's uh -huh. reform efforts. I understand they're tied to the department's reform efforts. It's just rather than adding mental health professionals so we could have less police response, it looks to me like we're adding more police response. I don't, I don't think it's mutually exclusive to um, want to do more in the area of mental health, but the, the efforts of the, the, the reform in making sure that we have um, additional resources that can work with communities, that can work with um, providing individuals and helping them navigate in the precincts with um, customer representatives in our precincts is a key part of the, uh, the reform effort. Okay, it's not mutually exclusive, but it is clear in each of those cases, we're spending more money, we're adding more policing. That seems to be what the de Blasio administration's reform efforts add up to. So um, I guess we have the information that we need, even if it's not information that we're satisfied with. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Council Member Rodriguez, followed by Council Member Holden. It's on the Thank you, Commissioner, for all the work that you've been doing. It, it, I wonder to know what is the number that we have today of police transit. It, can you share that number? And, and what is there a plan to increase the numbers of police officers in our train system so that we can deal with the level of violence in the train station? Yeah, so I'll, I'll thank you, Councilman. Uh, thank you for wearing the seatbelt there, too. Appreciate that. Keep, everyone keep safe. Um, I'll open it up, and, and Kathy O'Reilly is on this call. Uh, you know, we just had our first group coming out of the academy in some time. Transit is getting, I believe the number is roughly 80 officers out of that. It's, it, it's consistent with what traditionally we're trying to uh, bump up transit, high presence with auxiliary officers as well. When you look at the number, and Kathy will give it to you in a second, of what we currently have, you know, we've done some of the things that we've heard already on this call today, trying to move people from inside positions out. But we're in line with what we've traditionally had in, in the transit system over a number of years now. Sometimes people quote, well, pre-merge, there was more officers in transit, but people need to realize also that that's when, you know, we've streamlined efficiency post-merge. So whether it's record keeping or emergency service response or training units, those, those units don't need to be in the transit bureau anymore. It's kind of one for the whole department. It's more efficient. But thank you for the question. And Kathy will uh, bring it home here. Kathy? Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Council. Um, so approximately... Uh, uh, Mid-February, we surged uh, uh, about 500 additional offices into transit. That surge is still ongoing. It's a combination of resources from uh, Patrol uh, Services Bureau, from SRG, from our counterterrorism response, in addition to our, our auxiliaries, which we surged in this week. It's on average, it's 500. Some days, it's more. it, it can be as much as 600 offices have been surged into transit. But I, as the commissioner said, our numbers have been consistent for the uh, better part of two decades now. Uh, our uh, overall headcount is uh, just a little over uh, 2,500 uh, members of the, uh, the service. 
my second question is, and of course, like as you know, I I've, been stand, I've been I standing up with with the Brooklyn Board President Eric Gardens in our call to see an increase of more transit police and also to see more police officers inside the trains. Mm -hmm. And I feel it is important, and, and I know that it, you guys, you know, in the leadership role that you have, you have inherited these conditions. So it's not just about blaming you, any of you, a commission and the rest of you, but this is about how can we change that approach and understand that we need to see more police officers inside the train and also to deploy more, to deploy social work and working together in partnership with the NYPD, men and women who work in transit inside the train. My second part is, is about, you know, what is the future of, of, of fighting violence? And as we also know, I, I been partner standing together with Eric Adams in his role as a Brooklyn Board President in his call for four points that he believed that are important to increase and improve safety in our train station. One is a better coordination between the city and the MTA to address the violence in the train stations. And the second one also to, this, to deploy social workers inside the train station. Have you been looking at those proposal coming from Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams? Are we, should we expect you know, a more aggressive plan with more resources, with more deploy, more coordination to address the level of violence in our train, a train in the train stations? So, Councilman, I'd just like to respond first and foremost to remind everybody that major crime is down 43% this year in the transit system. What we are doing is working with MTA, DHS, our mental, uh, mental health partners in de dealing with the persons in crisis uh, that are causing these one or two incidents that occur that over, uh, you know, have been over uh, sensationalized. Uh, but we also recognize the, 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 the perception and the fear that the, the ridership feels. So that's why we're surging our officers into transit onto the platforms. They're riding the trains. They're uh, speaking with the conductors. They're speaking with the token booth clerks. clerks. So we, you should be, and everybody should be seeing an absolute increased tr uh, police presence in the, in the transit system. I, my other question, of course, you know that I uh, I would not miss it. It's about diversity in the leadership of the YPD. I appreciate, I know that all of you guys love uh, Chief Pichardo and it was a big loss that we have. And, and I also feel that it was a big loss for our own community, in this case, from the Latino community. Uh, and, and I hope that in the next couple of months, Commissioner and the rest of the team, that you can also right. look at potential a, a great candidate that we have that should be promoted inside the NYPD. Is there any plan for that to happen? Well, we're currently, I, I share your thoughts on Chief Pichardo. He was a, a, a phenomenal man. He was a good uh, person and he was a friend and he was a big loss to this department. Uh, we currently, you know, uh, when you look at across the department, we are a very versed de uh, department at the lower levels, and I'm proud to say at the top levels as well, but always more work to be done. And the answer to your question is yes. I will constantly be looking at diversity in making position appointments, not only yesterday, but tomorrow as well. We need more Latino in the top leadership. I'm proud. I represented by my black, by my wife who do a great job as a father of two daughters. I just want my street to be safe. I rely on you guys, but we also we need to know as being Latino, 29% the second larger group. I need to see more at the top level. So, but thank you for your leadership. Well, I, 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 I will say that I attended a, a leadership breakfast about a week ago of the Latino Officers Association, Hispanic Society, excuse me. And it was the executive members there. And you are right. There is, the good news is there is an awful lot of talented men and women um, of Hispanic heritage at, at some of the uh, high levels, and uh, we will continue to look at them as we make future appointments. I agree with you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank we you. We now hear from Councilmember Holden, followed by Councilmember Lewis. Your time will begin. Thank you.
thank you, Commissioner Shea, for the work that you do and your dedication and to your officers uh, on duty every day. You guys uh, are doing a great job and I appreciate the people of my district appreciate the effort of the NYPD. Uh, my question is, um, uh, in my district, the, uh, the NCOs, the Neighborhood Coordination Officers, have been pulled from their primary responsibility of working with the community to work on that right now they're doing open cases that, that we see a lot of. So they're really being pulled away from the community. Does your budget fully fund the NCO program? I'm sorry, can you repeat that councilman? The last, just the last line. Does your budget fully fund the NCO program? Well, listen, when you thank you for the your earlier comments. And when you talk about the NCOs, I can go a lot of different directions here, but it is an integral part of what we do as a department. It's key to our philosophy in neighborhood policing. Um, you know, and, and as, as Christine or Rodney will tell you, Rodney is trying to get the mic here. You know, um, when, when you look at our overall budget, that is worked into our overall budget. And we are uh, staffed regarding our NCOs. Rodney, you want to pick it up? So, so council member, uh, you know, I happen to to be in a very blessed position and through my journey up to this rank, uh, I was uh, a big part of creating neighborhood policing. And uh, one of the roles of the NCOs, to, in order for them to be successful, they're not supposed to be touched and their only job is to make sure that they have that relationship with the communities that they're, that they're assigned to. Uh, that was the goal and the uh, infrastructure of neighborhood policing is making sure that they're not being redeployed to do anything else but to be assigned to the neighborhood coordination spot and making sure that they're having the build a block meetings, working with the community members, identifying the issues and how do we work together to resolve them. Um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Chief Holmes. Maybe she knows a little bit more about it, but this is an easy fix. Uh, we'll make sure we, we get it back on the, on the appropriate tracks and make sure that they're not being reassigned or redeployed to handle other issues within the, uh, within, the, uh, within the precinct. So I'm going to agree with the council member. It's something we've been looking at. NCOs have been pulled in 10 different directions. I know part of the reason why they're there naturally is career. It's career incentivized. And that has a lot to do with going to an investigative track but it's something that we've been speaking about uh, here in the department administration as far as refocusing them because they have been doing a lot of uh, investigative work and their sole function is out there to facilitate, coordinate relationships with the community. So it is something we're looking at. Um, how can we better um, you know, get back to basics for lack of a better term uh, with our neighborhood coordinating officers? Thank you. Thank you, Chief Holmes. Because yeah, it is. Uh... The, the idea of the NCOs was to engage with the community. And uh, unfortunately, that's taken, you know, because of the budget hit, that's taken um, its toll on, on their, their connections with the community. But uh, Commissioner Shea, I have a question on, um, we heard, so I heard today there were 23 cases of complaints against officers um, and eight, eight cases that, that dealt with the use of force during the protest. So I'd like to know on the other side of that, how many officers were injured during the protest and what was the impact in overtime or staffing levels as a result of those injuries? Well, there was hundreds, unfortunately. There was hundreds of officers. I, um, you know, unfortunately, it's still, thank God, to a much, much lesser degree, Councilman, a, a much less of a problem now. Uh, we still do uh, um, suffer an injury uh, occasionally at some of these ongoing protests now. Nothing like last year, thank God, but at the peak last year, I think the number was approximately 500 officers injured, some of them quite seriously, some of them, frankly, that will probably cause the end of their careers. Um, and, and I don't have a dollar amount of the cost there, but obviously there was a significant dollar amount, not only to the, the injuries, which is most serious, but to the property damage and, and the amount of vehicles that are, that are um, damaged is an ongoing problem in New York City. I mean, I could tell you, and I don't want to bore you, but some really discouraging things like the homeless outreach unit, which we rely on to help homeless uh, people all over the city get services. This is before it was taken away last year. We, we lost uh, a significant number of those vehicles last year that were, I believe, burned. 
Um, so all of this, um, you know, we, ne we never as a city, all of us, the council, the PD, and the city don't want to go back there, but it certainly had a, uh, both an emotional and a fiscal cost. Time has expired. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chairs. We will now hear from Council Member Lewis, followed by Council Member Miller. Your time will begin. Good morning, and thank you, Chairs Drum and Adams, for your leadership. Thank you, Commissioner Che, for joining us as well as your team. Um, I think Councilmember Holden asked one of my questions, but I'll I'll change it a little bit. But just my first question is according to the submission for the executive budget, um, there were two roles listed, the community assistant and community ambassadors roles. I just wanted to know if you could share further details on those yeah. roles and how the hiring process will be. Yeah, I'm going to turn it to Danielle. So Danielle, is Danielle on? in a moment and and i'll just queue it up for danielle and you know coming out of uh the tough year that we had last year as everyone on the council knows and it funneled through the council the reform initiative that we went through we heard from all over the city um good and bad uh, about what people thought about the police and the state of public safety in new york city and it, it kind of goes hand in hand with something juanita and i and others put together last year customer service treating people that come into precincts as if they're a customer and how do we treat crime victims and people that want information, et cetera. So as we were working on that one project, now along comes the reform initiative and we started to hear the same things again. So Danielle, if you could just describe where we are with the community ambassadors and, and the, the other positions that we're looking at um, moving forward. Sure, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so we have two positions that uh, were brought up. The customer service representative is the first one. This is the one that we were granted 180 positions, uh, community assistant positions in, in the recent budget. Uh, so the goal there is really to assign them to precincts, transit, and housing. Um, we'll have multiple customer service representatives in our precinct facilities. They'll be the first point of contact to welcome visitors in um, and ensure really that they're able to navigate the precinct, access the services they need, whether it's, uh, whether it's um, accident reports, whether it's seeing the detective, um, they will log and track the number of visitors. They'll make sure that people aren't waiting and they'll really be that front facing welcoming presence into, into the precinct facility. Um, and the same for transit housing. And actually some of the plan is for some of our other uh, services across the department, whether it be property clerk, license division, other areas where we see high traffic uh, visitors. And Danielle, just a quick question. Will the community ambassador and community assistants, will they work siloed or together? Because one is patrol borough, the other one is uh, in the precinct. So how does that work? Yep, and the idea is for really for them to be a network. So, um, of course, they're, they're siloed under, under each of the bureaus, but we um, plan to have regular communication, sharing best practices, and they're also going through a department-wide training as they come on board. That'll educate them on both department policies, practices, how to access certain information, but also a customer service training that will be consistently given across um, all the bureaus. Thank you. Uh, is there more to that to that i was going to switch to the community oh, yes. ambassadors if, yes so and and i can punt this one also to deputy commissioner parker who the community ambassadors will fall under but um these are eight positions um community ambassador title these are really um very external focused one assigned to each patrol borough um, they will be out in the communities they will be um, navigating, working with uh, community complainants, victims. They'll report directly to the borough commanders um, and they will really be out in the field serving as a liaison for all problems, um, disturbances. We'll be linking them in to um, assist with any protest response, um, large gatherings, community issues, um, and they'll be really serving the community any needs and priorities that, that they have. 
Uh, Chauncey, do you want to add anything to that? Sure, I can. Uh, hi, Council Member Lewis. Uh, I did, uh, so of the um, two of the community ambassadors have been hired. They uh, started yesterday, and a third is in um, is in the process and should be starting hopefully very very soon. They come with. Um, we're trying to put together almost like an Ocean's Eleven kind of skill set. So there are some. One of them comes from DYCD background. Another comes from HRA. Another one comes from a CBO background. Um, also from different parts of the city. But they're, as, as Danielle said, they're all part of a network and really the police commissioner's philosophy of customer service and everything we, that we do, that the police department has done so well on the protect side of, of keeping people safe in the city. And he said as a North Star is community service. And through, in particular, what Chief Holmes has set up, that, that's going to be, all, everybody look, all of these components will be, um, will be incorporated to make sure that we're providing ex exceptional service to all New Yorkers. All right, thank you for that. I did wanna ask some follow-up questions in regards to that, like, will they be uniformed? Will they have access to ComStat? But we could talk about that another time because I don't think I have that much time left. And I do have another question regarding the CVAP program, the Victim Assistance Program that's transferring from NYPD to MockJ. I wanted to know what does that look like regarding the employees uh, that'll be transferred over? Will there be any layoffs? Is it the same amount of employees transferring over to NYPD to Mock J? That's Chris, Christine, if you have it. Yeah, there, there won't be any layoffs uh, and the majority of the staff are employed by uh, Safe Horizon. So the contract is transferring over. Um, and so they'll, they'll be with that contract. So there's no one's gonna lose their, the intent is not for anyone to lose their position tied to this. Awesome. And regarding the YCO program, I didn't see any information in there. And I know Council Member Holden touched a little bit on NCOs, but I wanted to know about the YCO program. I wanted to know, would it be funded in the FY22 budget? Is this something that your agency wants to continue to move forward? Oh, well, I mean, I'll take that one. It, absolutely. It's at the heart of everything that we're doing continuing to work with kids and we're funding that through our headcount. So that's, that's offices that are assigned to every precinct and, and housing uh, district across the city and, and working with a specialization to really, you know, that's under Chauncey Parker, under Jeff Madry, Community Affairs, certainly Juanita Holmes. I mean, those are her people more often than not in Dave Barrer and just continuing to work work with the kids of this city. I meant what I said on day one, that that to me is the greatest crime fighting that we do, keeping kids out of trouble in the first place. So incredibly proud. I mean, we would do a separate presentation for you, Councilwoman, on just some of the good things, great things we're doing with partners across this city to really serve um, families and kids. And Commissioner, I would really appreciate that because I don't get any follow-ups regarding the YCOs um, in my district. So I would love to see what's been happening in the past year regarding that. But I'll yield back to Chairs uh, Drum and Adams. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Councilmember Lewis, was your question in regard to the um, community ambassadors with the uniforms? Yeah, I wanted to know if they would be considered uniformed ambassadors. No, those are civilian. They're, they're, they're civilian members. They're not in uniform. Will they have access to ComStat, being that they do have to do some type of reporting? I'm not sure what you mean by that. I mean, the numbers, certainly, we, we push public online. They'll certainly, as employees, have, you know, full range of access to, you know, the department. So the, I'm, I'm going to say yes, but I, we could follow up that discussion if you want. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll yeah. yield back to you, Chair Drum. Thank you so much. Thank you. Back to Council. Uh, we'll now hear from Council Member Miller, followed by Council Member Cornegie. Good time. Morning. Okay. Good morning, Chairs, uh, Adams, Drum, uh, Commissioner, you and your team. Uh, good morning to you. Uh, I want to first be begin by thanking uh, Chief Harrison for coming out to last night's uh, uh, Iftar event uh, in, in Jamaica. It was it was well received. Your team you were well received, and want to thank you and, and and the department for the overall attention to detail that we you pay to the Muslim community uh, during the uh, Ramadan uh, celebration this, this month and what will uh, occur the next few days. Um, so I wanna uh, ask about um, 
civilianization and, and where we are and the reduction of those numbers, obviously, is something that we've been speaking about for the last seven or eight years. Uh, obviously, uh, officers that are doing jobs that are uh, uh, within the titles of civilians. Now, you also mentioned that there was 100 civilian jobs that were lost who filled those, who are filling those responsibilities. And does that add to the civilianization of, of the department? Uh, that, that is my, my first uh, question. And then secondly, um, I had a, had a bill that was not introduced, but we had conversation about once we talked about the removal of the um, school safety officers from the NYPD and the bill would codify um, the feasibility of the, the, the movement of the Department of Education uh, transfer of the school agency agents and, and, and the responsibilities and where those responsibilities would go, um, what the impact would be on, on students and families in the school building. That has not happened in terms of the legislation, um, but could, has the, the department, are you able to, and along with the, your DOE partners, are you able to, to, to uh, codify and, and address the feasibility of these actions and, 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 the, and the transfer of services detailed um, based on responsibilities of the current responsibility of school safety agents? And then furthermore, um, you know, and, and, and that, that would be a DOE portion that, that, you know, what kind of professional development are we looking at in, in enhancing the, the uh, skill sets of the current school safety agents to whatever title they will be transferred into um, around, you know, professional development and enhancing those uh, skill sets. Obviously, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and diminish the work that they've done over the past uh, 25 years and, and uh, creating an environment uh, for our young people uh, that is conducive to learning, considering that they're often the only semblance of community, black and brown women, when they leave their household that they see for the next eight hours. Um, and, you know, just sometimes the, the, the dialogue um, that has occurred around this conversation has been un unfair at best. So if we could address the civilianization and then the, uh, the feasibility of, of the transfer, um, I have others, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I know there's a, a ton of other folks waiting to ask questions. Thank you, uh, cheers, and, and, and I look forward to hearing the answer to those questions. Councilman Miller, thank you for, uh, you know, thank you for recognizing the men and women in the school safety. I, I agree with you that they're, they're some of the best that New York City has. Uh, I'll turn it to Christine in a moment to talk about the civilianization specifically with school safety. Um, you, you started talking about uh, civilianization, I think, in the beginning about under the broader spectrum of what is our philosophy in terms of, and I, I think we share the same. At, at every opportunity, we are trying to get uniformed police officers with everything we've heard from every council member today, and we share it, getting full duty able-bodied police officers back on the street wherever possible, uh, out from behind desks, et cetera. We've, been, we've probably talked too much about this for years. I think we're doing um, more than we ever have in trying to free up people and get them onto the street. That's where New Yorkers need it, need the men and women, and that's where they have the best impact with neighborhood policing. Um, the, the, we are concerned. I personally am concerned as we see the the attrition on the civilian side of the department, that we're seeing the potential for that in reverse. And it's something that we are strongly uh, trying to combat that happening. And in, in other words, as the civilian population of the department shrinks, having to now do reverse, put the cops back inside to fill some of these positions. That will be the last thing we do, um, but it is something that is a possibility. And Christine, you can give specifics on numbers and school safety. Um, yes, yeah, so specific to civilianization, uh, as the commissioner said, you know, it's something we're committed to. Uh, we've identified future positions we can civilianize uh, should we receive additional resources. But um, given the fiscal situation, we, like all agencies, um, uh, we've, we've lost a lot of positions to, to attrition. Um, compared to last year, we're down 850 uh, civilians. 
Um, and so while we are able uh, to hire on a, a two-for-one basis, um, that for us, like all other agencies, uh, does have an impact on our overall civilian headcount. But as the commissioner said, we do really try to maintain what we can in terms of uh, having the civilians perform the, the functions that have been identified. Uh, and we do look forward to, as hopefully the fiscal condition improves for the city as a whole, continuing to have discussions about further civilianization. Um, on, on the school safety, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure I'm, I'm clear on exactly which piece you're getting at, Council Member. Could you just repeat the, the question on that? Timeline, maybe. Actually, we weren't actually talking about the timeline itself. We were, to we were talking about or the actual implementation. We were, we were codifying the feasibility, um, first off, because this was early on, whether or not it was necessary to do it, what would happen, and those individual responsibilities that now lie within the purview of school safety, what happens to them, uh, and, and uh, as well as uh, the impact on, on students and families based upon the services that are being delivered, non-law enforcement and, and, and law enforcement in alike. Well, I'll take that then. So I, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of different opinions on this, Councilman Miller, um, and I respect all the opinions. What we're focused on is, you know, we'll take our marching orders and we're going to carry them out. So the reality is the process has started. We'd be negligent if we didn't start that process. I think Councilman Drum mentioned that earlier. We have to be work ongoing to assume that this is what's happening. So Chief Obey and, and Chief... Um, Homes before her have been meeting with DOA, and uh, we expect this to take place, I think it's next year. Um, is it the right thing to do? I'll leave that for others to debate. Uh, you know, as I, I'm just hopeful that it has no negative impact on kids. It shouldn't. Those people uh, that work for school safety currently that are NYPD employees, if they transition over, um, they are some of the best people I've ever met. They are completely committed to the uh, well-being of the students in the New York City public school system. So at, at, this, as the, at this point around implementation, has there been any of that such conversation uh, around codifying the actual experiences and responsibilities? And of yeah. course, has this conversation occurred with, with the bargaining units of, of the folks that are, that are involved? Uh, in terms of, you know, ensuring that they maintain their level of compensation, or whatever. But it, 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 quite frankly, I, I think it's even more about how do we serve our young people? How do we keep school yeah. buildings safe? How do we keep them dignified and, and, and respectable? And, and, and so have we assessed the impact of the removal of these uh, school safety agents in their current position and have we determined what any future position would look like and, and, and the impact on that on on our 1.2 million uh, young folks and what happens to these 80 uh, percent of the work for black and brown women uh, workforce um, if, if they are removed from school safety in, in the future so really looking to see what that process looks like before we move on and 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 the impact it will not just have on uh, the school building, the students, but ultimately communities, uh, if in fact we, we do this and do not assess the feasibility um, of, of such a move. Not saying that it's, it's, it's even the wrong move at this time, yeah. but we need to know what we're doing in, in doing so. No, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a real interesting discussion. Um, you have parents, you have teachers, yeah. you have labor leaders, you have the kids, let's not forget the kids, you have elected officials, you have community groups, everyone I think is united that they want what's best for the kids, everyone has slightly different opinions, I think all of this is being spoken about as this is ongoing, Lola do you want to comment you're in those meetings? Lola, Chief Obey. I'm sorry I couldn't unmute for a minute, I was going to jump in. Uh, thank you, Councilman. So just to follow up on the hearing uh, we had in February, um, I know that there's some um, concern about not really knowing about the transition as to what's happening. So 
in terms of community engagement, and this is in Brooklyn, so CEC 16 put together a, um, 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 a Zoom meeting about two, three weeks ago, and I think it was an eye opener for the NYPD and the DOE. So this just speaks to your concern about the SSAs themselves. It was apparent to everyone on the panel that this, uh, the agents themselves were not really engaged. The, the DOE has spoken to us about that in terms of labor and the union. Uh, we have to have labor on the PDN speak to the DOE labor. When they come together, make a decision, we'll go ahead. And of course, involving the union also. We can't have the, uh, the agents engage without labor and the unions. Uh, we've got, when you speak to the DOE, uh, we've been super supportive. Uh, they describe it as a functional transfer. So I know there's some concerns about SSAs, you know, 5,000 plus, like uh, Commissioner Ryan mentioned, uh, we have an authorized headcount of 5,063 agents. We're currently down 554. So there is some concern because there hasn't been any, uh, any uh, classes since January of 2020. If we continue at this pace, we will not have enough agents come September. So I just wanted to also mention that. So DOE says functional transfer, I just wanna mention that. Also training, uh, the DOE has done an amazing job. We've really partnered up with them very closely with implicit bias training. So a lot of the training, we have thousands of our agents trained uh, by the DOE. Uh, next week, they're gonna target the executives in the uh, school safety division. So we'll continue with that. So CEC train, a CEC 16 meeting, huge eye opener. Right now we're at the point where we have to engage the agents. There's a lot of fear, there's concern. 72.6% of uh, our agents, as we mentioned, are women. 90% of our agents are people of color. So I thank you for your concern uh, and your support, uh, uh, Councilman Miller. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna, you, we're gonna have to move on at this point to our next uh, council member. We've going to be given a lot of extra time. Council member Miller. Thank, thank you, council member Drum. Thank you once again for your leadership. Okay, thank you. And also I just wanna say that there is concern about whether or not we should actually hire more police for the schools or use those resources differently. But that being said, we'll go on to our next council member. We will now hear from council member Cornegy, followed by council member Menchaca. The time will begin. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Hey, how are you commissioner? Uh, thank you Great. chairs, both, both chairs Adams. Um, uh, and also Chair Drum, um, I want to start by saying um, I I'm excited about the fact that the NYPD brass is more reflective of the communities that we serve in, whether it's Chief, uh, whether it's First Dep Tucker, whether it's Chief Obey, whether it's Chief Royster, whether it's Chief Holmes, whether it's the Chief Harrisons uh, jointly. Um, you know, I, I think that that shows a movement in the right direction for a lot of us who've been around, who who've asked for the... Um, the cadet classes to be more reflective of the communities that they serve in. I also want to state that I don't think it's mutually exclusive to demand reform and accountability while still supporting the men and women who go to work every single day with two mandates, which is to serve in the communities that they're assigned and return home safely to their families. Having said that, Commissioner, what programs would you point to that directly lead to building a better relationship between the NYPD and the communities that they serve in? Well, I'll mention the one name right off the bat, uh, Councilman Cornegy, and thank wait, you wait, for- Wait, wait, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Commissioner. I left out Chief Madry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> before you, before <laughs> you go there, I forgot Chief Madry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Chief. You're going to pay. You're gonna <laughs> yeah, you're going you're gonna to pay for that one. No Absolutely. more community affairs in your district. <laughs> but, Absolutely. And, and Kim Royster, who's doing a phenomenal job as Chief of Transportation. So I they, believe uh, I said I'm, I said Chief Royce, though, I uh, you, you, you probably did. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, not to relive last year, but we got to relive last year. We got to continue to do it every day. Um, trust is at the heart of every single thing that we do. And, and that extends to the community, trust between law enforcement and elected officials, too. And I think that's on me and, and us that sometimes we're not trusted in what we say and what we do. Uh, everything that we do, um, you know, when we talk about crime meetings, we also talk about building trust, uh, whether it's myself and Chief Rodney Harrison, Chief Juanita Holmes, Chief Jeff Madry. What are we doing? Are we doing the right thing? How is it being perceived? Um, this, these are conversations that happen daily. When, with what are we doing? 
Lord, we don't have, we can't put it in five minutes. I'm sure of that. Um, the, the amount of uh, things that we are doing, I'll give you a couple off the bat, what we've done this week. You know, look at what we did in Harlem last week with refurbishing basketball courts. And it's not about playing basketball. It's about working with elected officials and working with the residents of public housing and giving people hope and giving people something to do with the summer coming. Chauncey Parker, I got to give a tremendous amount of credit. NYCHA, I got to give credit. Uh, Councilwoman Ayala from East Harlem, I got to give credit. The mayor, you know, we made it happen and we're going to roll out another 14. And we worked with federal authorities and took money that often is used to fight crime and we put it back into the community. I, th I think that's a real positive. And it was very well received in East Harlem. And we have 14 more sites coming before the summer. We're going to rehab a, a field in Harlem by July 1st. Chauncey, if you're listening, otherwise you're fired. Um, that, that is going to happen, the Colonel Young Field, by July 1st. That's happening. The work that we do with council members and elected officials at 127 Penn, instrumental in doing, it's not just about sports, but career building. Uh, the work we do with the Police Foundation in getting kids jobs and training. Um, the work of the youth officers with sports leagues all over New York City. And field trips. The recruitment drive, uh, Councilman Cornegie, that we just did. Hearing the community, listening to, hey, we want to be reflective and more diverse. So we did an extra push this year. And we're going to do a press conference next week. I'm probably short-circuiting DCPI here. But we're going to have really, really good news to report on our recent police test recruitment drive. Outstanding. So I, I'm, I'm so proud of some of the members that you mentioned, but really all the members of the department that are working um, with this philosophy. And it's not one or the other. It's not be tough on crime or be good to the community. It has to be both. Um, so everything we do is committed to that. Jeff Madry, you want to say anything? Say something you nice, Chief. I made a mistake. Say something nice. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Commissioner, to, uh, to the chairs of the council, and to my uh, high school classmate, uh, Tom, uh, Councilman Carnegie, but he was uh, uh, ahead of me in high school. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. It's, uh, you know, I think the, the police commissioner really detailed a lot of things that we're doing to help build trust in the community. And for me, building trust starts with building relationships, making sure we take every opportunity to sit and sit and um, speak with our communities. And, and that's been some of the toughest things but some of the most rewarding things I think we've been doing over the last year when we've been going into communities and sitting with young people, adults, uh, talking to young students over Zooms about some of the things that transpired last year with law enforcement and the protests and many other things. And I think that was a tremendous part of building relationships which are gonna, which are gonna be the foundation of building trust. Uh, we are rolling out so many different programs that are gonna be fun, but at the same time, they're gonna really stimulate young people, help out adults as well. One of the things that uh, we're doing here in uh, community affairs is something, you know, you, you may laugh at it, but it's, it's gonna be amazing when we roll it out, is this box car derby that we're doing with young people. And if you see the work, when you talk about STEM principles, science, technology, engineering, math, these young people are building box cars that they're gonna race at a certain point, at a certain point during the summer, and it's really incredible to see how young, how these young, intelligent uh, children are building these cars uh, from the ground up. And you're talking about building trust and building relationships. The parents are coming out there. Uh, it's going to be a big event this summer when we roll it out. And when we roll it out, I believe so many people are going to want to get involved with it because. It teaches these principles of STEM and it helps build relationships. And again, just going through the summer with all the things that we're gonna be doing, the options program that's gonna help work with mm -hmm. young people and their emotional intelligence, financial literacy, and other academic areas. Uh, you know, Councilman Cornegie, we, we're partnered with AAU. We're running a 500 team basketball tournament 
that's going to attract teams from the tri-state. Uh, there's just so many things that we're going to be doing. The YPA, the Youth Police Academy, that's going to take young people and really help our parents when we give young people things to do and allow the parents to go to work and do other things. And besides just going into communities, going into communities that are plagued by violence, going down to their streets, shutting down streets, working with the uh, community, going into parks, creating safe spaces. These are all the things that we'll be doing, the precincts, community affairs, and I think it's going to go a long way into building relationships and building trust throughout this summer. Hey, Jeff, if I could just say one last thing, Councilman, yes. I forgot to mention, I know I'll be quick. This week we were in a park in Staten Island working with the community, just cleaning up and beautifying a park, which I thought was great. And I know a lot of people do things like this, which is all positive. The graffiti initiative that we did last month, and we still do, and Jeff Madry is instrumental in that. It wasn't just about cleaning graffiti. It was about working with people. And this is a budget hearing, so what did it cost us? It didn't cost us a penny. We got, we got paint and supplies donated from businesses. We got community groups and kids to come out. And we even had cops coming in on their own time from home with their families, with the community members, painting over graffiti. So it's just another great example. And Jeff Madry mentioned the boxcar. I got the scar here. The last time I did a boxcar, I wound up getting stitches at the hospital. So I'm out of that business. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on to our next council member. We'll now hear from Councilmember Menchaca, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal. Your time will begin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairs, for the incredible leadership today in the budget hearing. I want to start with the, it's just a quick dollar amount of money that was associated with the press uh, credential department. Uh, how much is that in savings for the NYPD? John Miller, you want to? Okay, well, they're getting that. Um, let's move over to the federal monies. Uh, the federal monies, you, you just referred to them, uh, Commissioner, and the budget and the, that the council approves annually doesn't account for those federal grants that come in that you mentioned, which gets the NYPD at an added amount. How much does NYPD expect to receive in federal funds for this next fiscal year? Christine, yep. About sorry, 200, sorry. Uh, on average, we receive about $200 million in federal funding per year. Uh, we anticipate uh, in the coming fiscal year, it may be a little bit lower because in the uh, recent past, we've received money for uh, the protection of uh, the president's residence. Uh, obviously, with the change in the administration, we won't receive some of that funding, um, but so it might be closer to uh, a little below 200 million but 200 and million when does that get finalized is that something that happens before the budget so you'll understand it so we can put it in there uh the grants um and and the federal grant cycle depending on the grant the timing varies which is actually why you see the budgets adjust budget adjusted throughout the fiscal year uh so unfortunately we don't have um the exact amount of the awards across the entire uh, funding categories um, at the time of the adopted budget, but with each budget update and with each uh, modification, uh, you can see the, the grant funds go up. And can you give us a sense of, uh, and this is for later for follow up, which which funding streams are you expecting? I know you talked about some changes. Is that something that you can give us in line item with amount? Yeah, we, we can we can give you the history of what we've gotten and it remains relatively constant year over year, so we can provide you with that detail. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, the first 11... question we have, John has the answer for you. Okay. Over. Sure. Um, that uh, for the issuing of the press cards, that involves uh, three or four staff people. There are thousands of these credentials uh, issued. There's a little uh, background that goes into that to make sure that these are uh, legitimate members of the media. Um, some equipment, laminating machines, and um, yeah, what's identification that total? Identification services. Uh, it's a uh, Probably about four hundred and sixty-five million dollars, uh, maybe slightly more. Okay, four hundred and sixty-five million dollars. <laughs> I'm sorry, not million. Four hundred sixty-five thousand dollars. You know, when I when I hear Christine talk, it's all millions. But the press card is actually uh, just uh, hardware, supplies, and personnel. Yeah, and, and that's what we're talking about here. Okay, next question. 
11 million dollars of federal funding was allocated to support NYPD's budget for COVID related costs. It is our understanding that NYPD plans to spend this funding on personnel for overtime. I know that was a conversation earlier today by the chair um, at vaccination sites. So why is overtime necessary for NYPD personnel at vaccination sites? Christine, do you have that? I mean, I don't know if that pertains to when we were vaccinating the public or not, but if. Uh, it, it, part, part of it is for personnel um, assisting at the vaccination sites uh, with the public. And then there are some of our staff also uh, working um, some on overtime to vaccinate our own, our own staff. But again, I'm trying to understand why, why under overtime are we utilizing that system of overtime for officers in vaccination sites. That's what I'm trying to understand here. In, in, if it's in a priority, I, I guess if vaccination is a priority with NYPD, why did why is this an overtime expend, expense versus a a an expense that is not overtime, which is different and is causing a lot of issues in today's conversation? So let me, let me get the details just on specifically which um, element of the uniform, uh, sorry, of the overtime budget that 11 million is going to. Just give me a minute on that and I'll come back to you. Okay, uh, next question. The, the, the 22 budget pro uh, proposes adding 216 uh, new civilian positions to the NYPD to increase community engagement, which is about $15 million. Does the community engagement division collaborate with community-based organizations how are they working together? Can you give us a sense about um, why it's necessary for 200 civilian positions uh, to be increased at the NYPD when we really need to be moving dollars to the, the infrastructure that's on the ground, nonprofits that are doing mutual aid work that, that need that kind of money in this, in this budget? Yeah, Councilman, I'll, I'll start that as Christine is getting the last answer and Danielle, Councilman, from what I understand of that question, I could be wrong, but Danielle will correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's the same question that was answered before, and it comes directly out of the reform movement where the intent was to hire uh, positions within the NYPD directly to increase and improve collaboration with those community groups. So that would be why there was a police angle, because that's the whole intent of the mission. Danielle, do I have that right? That's correct, sir. Okay, uh, I don't know if there was more on the on the overtime with vaccination sites. Yeah, so uh, essentially, it's it's a mix of uh, funding for um, non personnel costs and also overtime for school safety agents for the public vac vaccination sites, <clears throat> and some uh, uniform overtime for our medical division. Uh, just because of the, the nature of having to do this, obviously, this was in addition to other people's functions and duties. And while it was a key priority, uh, we needed to have the flexibility to utilize overtime to make sure we could appropriately staff to get the vaccine uh, out to our employees and to the public. Okay. Again, I, it doesn't answer the question about why why overtime is paying for this, but, um, but I, I, I do see a hand from uh, Chief of Person. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council Member. Good afternoon. So, so the, the vaccination falls under me. I'm, I'm the Chief of Personnel in the Medical Division. The reason we use officers on, on overtime is our doctors and nurses were the main vaccinators. We also identified police officers that are para paramedics. In order to, to vaccinate officers on all three platoons, because they work midnights, four to twelves, and um, the day tours, we had them working 12 hour tours in the beginning. Uh, in addition, we did overtime uh, when we went to the NYCHA locations in, in Harlem as well as Staten Island, where we were able to vaccinate over 1,300 elderly residents of, of NYCHA. Uh, we also were uh, uh, given the ability to vaccinate retirees and el eligible family, family members. And I would like to say, you know, si since January 6th, our medical division uh, administered nearly 85,000 first and second doses. And that includes 15,000 alone at 127 Penn, which is a public site uh, that we've been doing the Johnson and Johnson vaccination for about six or seven weeks now. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Okay. Can I just uh, jump in here, Chair, if you don't mind? Um, 
Do we know how many NYPD personnel have been vaccinated? Yes. Yeah, so, so as I said, we started vaccinating NYPD personnel since January 6. Uh, as of this morning, we have a total of uh, 19,381 that we vaccinated. In addition to that, 861 were vaccinated outside of the department for a total of 20,000. 242, which is 38% of our department has been fully vaccinated. Uh, if it's if we're looking at just one vaccination, the number is 21,620, about 41% of the department. Counts, why, counts, why are those numbers can, so can low? I just, can I just add that, that it could be higher, although I don't really have any data or think it is. It could be, it probably is a little higher, but for HIPAA reasons and things, that's just what we administered. If they're getting it from outside the department, there's no obligation. We can't force them to tell us that. Are there any incentives vaccination in, uh, for NYPD personnel? So everyone, in the, as all city workers, they, they received the three hours of comp time. You know, and then if they were going on, you know, they would go on department time to get vaccinated too. So that was an incentive. No one uh, had to go to get vaccinated on their own time. How many have taken advantage of the comp time? Everyone who was fully vaccinated got the comp time. So what are you saying, 21,000? About 19,000. 19,000. Those numbers seem low. Well, council member, if you, if you look at, you know, uh, the military, uh, nearly 40% of the Navy is fully vaccinated. We're at 39%. The Marines, it's, it's actually 27%. Air Force, Space Force, they're about 36%. So I think, you know, we're doing a little better than the military. Uh, you look at other police departments throughout the country, some did a little better than us, where I think we're sitting right a little above average from other police departments. Um, yes, we want to see more people vaccinated, but I think uh, I think we're in a in a good place right now. But we could be. I'll I'll, I'll second that. Uh, I'd love to be higher. I'd love to be 100 um, percent. We've done a lot of outreach. We've had doctors, um, retired doctors, active doctors come and do videos. We've shot the videos to all our employees. Um, we have not mandated it. I don't think too many people have. Um, I, I agree with you, count, both councilwoman and councilman. I'd love to be at 100%. I don't know where the, the general public, you know, if you told me teachers or firemen or Major League Baseball players or anyone else, you know, where they fall, but I'd love to be setting the bar high. So if, if they're not required to be vaccinated, are they required to wear masks in the public? Yes. They're subject to the same... They're subject to the same um, requirements. Obviously, those requirements now are uh, lessening, and we follow the CDC guidelines. I, I would also like to add, you know, in, in addition to the vaccinations, since last March, we have over 11,000 members of the department who, uh, who were diagnosed with COVID positive that we know of. Um, you know, of that, 55 have passed away. Uh, of the 11,369 that were COVID positive, uh, over 3,400 received the vaccination, nearly 8,000 have not. So when you add the 8,000 that, that, that were COVID positive and not vaccinated to the vaccinators, you know, combined we're at 54%. Um, you know, some, some data would say, suggest that, you know, having, having had COVID in the past gives you some immunity, but not full immunity, but I think that's, that's part of it too. And that should be part of the discussion. But they still need the shot regardless. And, so, and we have done a video, Councilman Trump, a, yeah. saying exactly what you just said. You know, that's our message to our people, to, um, and, and really for the whole public, too. That's why we thought it was so important to go out to different parts of the community. And we were administering it to ourselves and to the community. Chair Adams, okay, if we move on. Yes. Okay, thank you. Let's go to our next council member. Council member Rosenthal, followed by council member Brannon. Great, thank you so much. Thank you chairs for the opportunity of this hearing. 
Um, two very fast questions about the overtime budget. Um, do you, when you look at the overtime budget, is it just like the total number of hours in overtime and you track whether or not the total numbers go up or down? Or do you have categories in there of, um, you know, groupings? And are those groupings by like, um, you know, the number, amount of overtime for parades, the amount of overtime for peaceful protests, the amount of overtime to protect monuments? We, we track our overtime in many different categories, not specifically exactly as you detailed them, but pretty detailed. Can you name two? Arrest, court, investigative, details, there's many. Great. Can you send that over to us for um, 2000, I guess, 18, 19, 20, and 21, and then expected for 22, since you track it so carefully? We'd love to work collaboratively with you. No, that's just a yes or no. If you have it, that's fine. If you don't have yeah, it, think, uh, that, yeah, that, uh, that's information that we provide uh, on a quarterly basis to the council. So we can make sure that you get a copy of that. Do we do oh, it every no, year? I can um, get it from staff. That's fine. And okay. do you ever do the analysis by number of years prior to retirement? We. Uh, yes, absolutely. We do. Why? We do a good job. Why? Why do you look at it that way by number of years prior to retirement for overtime? We look at it any number of ways, Councilwoman. So can you send it over um, in that particular one, um, analysis by number of years prior to retirement? Do we normally, do we have that? I don't, I don't even know. We, that's oh, not. You were so enthusiastic saying yes, of course. So. But Christine, what were you going to say? No, not how um, you looked at it. Uh, generally, from from the fiscal side, you know, we're looking at the hours, we're looking at the categories. Um, mm -hmm. I think we, we did. But it provide. sounds like someone's looking at it by number of years prior to retirement. I want to move on. So just yes or no, and sounds like you're enthusiastically yes. Can you just send it over? Anyone? We'll, we'll work together for I believe we sent some information uh, uh, in in the categorization for investigative and operational overtime by rank and years of service. Um, and we'll, uh, and we'll share that with you. Thank Make you sure so you get much. a copy Appreciate of that. Appreciate that. Really want to focus on the special victims division. Um, do, uh, do you do FETI training anymore? Uh, at a previous hearing, you said no. Jimmy, more yes. Not doing FETI training. Yeah. Um, we are working on a contract with a trauma informed sexual assault investigative course to replace the FETI. Good. Uh, so no one got it in 2019 or 2020? Might believe 2020. No, not last year, not in 2020. What we have done and we begin it. Okay, began so according to your report on training, it shows that seven people got the FETI training. Um, so I'm just trying to understand between the truth and what's in your public reports. Similarly, in your public reports, you show that um, in 2000, I think it's 19, 76 detectives were trained all together. And I'm wondering how that lines up with your staffing which shows over 200 detectives. So does everyone get training, any type of training or not? Yes, just uh, so last according month. According to the report, the answer is no, but it's zero. But go ahead, you tell me the truth. L last month we were able with COVID now, uh, COVID restrictions, we were able to start the Special Victims Investigation Court uh, course, which is a five day training of course at the academy, and uh, 30 police officers are assigned to the special victims had that training. So, given that 80% of your training is done by PowerPoint, why would you stop doing the training when that PowerPoint can be done remotely? And I guess. The real question is, because the answer is obviously it can continue, but the real question I have is, 
why are only a third of your detectives getting any training at all? That doesn't count for the ones that were seen. Yeah, that, that doesn't account for the people who are yeah. already in special victims. They're and supposed they to get training every year. So you're see, saying that it's one and done? People so, who get trained, it's just one year and that's it? And so over, for, this, for the questioning uh, and the FETI together, it's 80%, five days of 80% PowerPoint. And that's called training, and they get that once and they're done. Well, again, I'm just looking at your report. I'm saying the people who were already in special victims, which were 200 FETI people, were trained already in the FETI. I don't think so. Not according to your reports. If you want well, to send over some is, sort of documentation, this is prior, that, this is prior to the FETI contract being being canceled. They were uh -huh. trained in FETI. We mm -hmm. didn't have a contract last year. Right, we so none of that shows in your reports. So if you can try to make your reports show something that, uh, if you're trying to tell me now that people don't get trained every year, they only get trained once. And so we should only expect to see some smaller portion getting trained. It's really helpful to know. I think you should be public about that. Um, and by the way, I think it's wrong. None of the other best practice models throughout the country treat training as one and done. Training is done every year, as is the case with many professions. Um, so according to, uh, and in fact, in 2020, according to your report, eight detectives got training altogether. Eight. Is that new training, Councilwoman? I, I'm just looking at your training report which okay, shows eight good. people got trained. That sounds like what it is to me. Huh, okay. According to your SVD staffing, and this is since the DOI report came out, I, I, and of course I'm saying, huh, but what I really mean is, wow, that's really distressing. And I think we're gonna have to look into that a little bit more. Um, so according to your staffing report, um, we're looking at grade one detectives and at the end of uh, our invest our hearing in 2018, you said that you would endeavor to have more grade one detectives. So according to your reports, in 2018, there were 12 grade one detectives. In 2019, there were eight. And in 2020, there are four. So what are you doing to try to get more grade one detectives? Well, I, I, well, grade, first grade detectives is uh, a long process to get to. First, in order to be a detective, no, no, to, I understand to go into the process. detective. Yeah. You don't have to tell me the process again. I'm mm -hmm. asking you, I'm asking you what you're doing to reverse the downward trend because uh, in 2018, at a hearing, you promised the number would go up from 12. So now it's I, I, I don't two think years it's later a downward councilwoman, I don't think it's a downward trend. I think our, our 12, special 8, victim 4. detectives what are highly that? motivated. They're qualified. Okay. They're, I they're dedicated. They're, I, I hope to see um, a few they more do the job because ones. they love it. Uh, I believe since last April in the special victims division, uh, the commissioner, Chief Harrison, myself take promotions very seriously in the it's special victims division in the number they of have, grade one had detectives nine, at the special victims division if you'd let me finish they've had nine promotions I'd like you to really since <laughs> april nine promotions in april in mm -hmm. within the special victims division uh which is uh, how many uh, uh, promotions were there in other divisions you can't just uh, say if, a if number look, without uh, proportionality to other it, divisions, it, but I'm not going down this rabbit hole with you. The point mm -hmm. stands. The number of grade one detectives has gone down by four every year since 2018. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers are the numbers. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, uh, the, S the law that created the SVD training report required an analysis of best practices for um, uh, training 
the SVD detect detectives. Did you ever do an analysis of best practices? And the second part of that is, did you ever do an analysis of why you have the number of staff that you have uh, in each division of Special Victims Division? Can't quite hear you. I've been there five weeks in the Detective Bureau. We do look at how we assign our people. If you look back, we look at caseloads for the detector, for the special victims detectives. Uh, last year it was about 47 per, uh, 47 per investigator. Taking that uh, being an unusual year, you look back at 2019, it was at 51 per investigator. This year we're looking at the caseload per investigator. It's at 52. We look at that on an almost uh, weekly to monthly basis. I know what the if number that... is. I'm not asking you what the number is. I'm asking you why is the number what the number is, right? So again, if we go back to the 2018 hearing, we learned that best practices would be for the caseload of a detective to be around 14 cases. So now you're saying that you just sort of divide the number of detectives you have into the number of cases and that gives you 47 or 50. What I'm I, asking is what is the not, methodology you use to determine what the right number of hours should be allocated per case per detective? I, I, and obviously, I since you separate it out by the different divisions, child, cold case, you know the number for each division. Obviously, the number isn't, you know, just the average. No, can I, can, I'll jump in. I mean, there's a number of inaccuracies that I've heard here. Name number one, one. You're, not, you're, not a, you're not taking into account retirements, for one thing. Of first I'm just looking, if there are any uh, inaccuracies, looking, Commissioner, uh, if there are any inaccuracies, they are reflected in your report. I am simply describing to you what's in your report. So if there are accuracies, let's be clear about okay. who's being inaccurate. Okay. What I'm asking is very simple, sir. Do you have a methodology for determining how many hours per case per detective or do you back into it by the number of people you have divided by into the caseload? Simple question, methodology or no? The law required you have a methodology. There's not one on your website. I'm asking you for it. That's all, sir. But, but what I was referring to when I mentioned inaccuracies as well, the 14 case best practice, that to That's us- That's an that's inaccuracy? Me, that's an inaccuracy, sir. That yes. has been determined best practices by federal courts across the country. So you didn't mean to say inaccuracy. What you meant to say, sir, was that NYPD is different than other departments, because that's what you said in 2018. And in 2018, what you assured me was that you would come up with your own methodology that showed the right number of hours for best practices for the New York Police Department. I'm asking you what that analysis is. Uh, council member, if I, if I may, that analysis and the factors that we look at in order to do staffing pursuant to the law that you passed is on our website. No, I'm looking at it right uh, now. I well, am I'm so am I. It's called, it's titled it right factors now. that and the department utilizes to determine staff. will show the number of cases. The number of SVD cases, the right. number of it cases that are felonies versus what misdemeanors. the right number of hours should the be. The number of cases that involve children. Cases. You don't I mean, know I'm, I'm reading. Council member, I'm reading. I'm reading what the Excuse factors me, are, Excuse and me, sir. there seems Excuse to be a pattern. Me, Excuse me, sir. Please respect the council member and answer the council. Well, I mean, respectfully, me, chair. Sir. I think the council Excuse member me, needs sir, to respect. 
I'll the executive really staff here you. routinely interrupting Scott, the chief of detectives because you're not answering Scott, the questions. Uh, I think I think we are answering Scott, the question. I think I'm repeatedly, hearing cut. after hearing, when we do I'm these budget hearings, cut, sir. the reports are being mischaracterized. Please take control routinely. of your staff member. Oh, like let it go. We 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 know. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. What is it that you know, sir? And go that, ahead, that try to answer the question, but I would ask that you answer the question and not filibuster. I'm asking a very simple question. Let me what, ask what again. I know is make sure that you, woman, oh, you want to interrupt me now. Okay, go ahead. Well, you were yes, asking sir. your question. I'm trying to answer it, but I defer to you. I'd much rather hear from you. I'm asking you why it takes, why it takes the number of hours that you've allocated for detectives to do their work. Best practices nationally show it should be 14 cases per person. What's the number of cases per person in the NYPD and why? And you passed a law and I will just direct you to our website where we post all the information you're asking for. And I've just read it and had, I, had the answer been in there respectfully, sir, I would not be asking the question. If you want to, although the chair will not give me an opportunity, rightly so, I could read the one page report out loud, but let me summarize by saying that it says, however many cases there are, you will divide into the number of cases by the number of detectives. That's math. That's not an analytical approach to why it takes so many more or so many fewer hours. And sir, with all due respect, if the national model is 14 cases per detective as the best practice, why does the NYPD caseload why is it at 50? 50, sir. And why do you think that's good for outcomes of detective case investigations? Okay, we're going to leave it here and we're going to move on. Thank you, Chair. But thank you, Council Member, for your questioning. And we're going to move to our next Council Member. Yeah. Now have Council Member Brannon followed by Council Member Brooks Powers. Your time will begin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want to give a shout out to my home precinct, the 6 8, um, and Captain Tolson, who's doing a good job. We have crime here uh, is decreased year to date in every major category, um, and that's through partnership with the community and, and with the cops, and everyone is doing everything they can to. Uh, to look out for each other. So we certainly appreciate that down out here in, uh, in the Ozarks in uh, Southern Brooklyn. Um, I wanted to uh, get an idea. Can you confirm the budget for the NYPD's, uh, the co-response teams, which, which partner uh, an officer with a social worker? Can you, can you confirm um, the uniform and civilian headcount for those co-response team? Yep. Uh, Christine and then Terry Tobin can any specific questions about their functionality. Thank you. Ready, Christine? Yep. yep. Uh, so um, in the uh, in the current year, uh, we have uh, 33 uh, uniform personnel, and that actually goes up to the headcount goes up to 56 uh, in the next fiscal year and beyond. And what's the budget for the core response teams? Um, in, in the current year, uh, it is about 3.7 and it's 6 million in the baseline. So, okay, so you mean we've spent, so, how does that work? Uh, they're, they're, the funding, it's, it's $6 million program annually. Okay. And is there, is there a, can you confirm if there's a plan to expand the core response teams? I know I heard some, some talk about that. There currently is not. There's not a plan to expand. Yes, sir. 
And is that is that for any reason? I mean, not from from results or just a change in course or? I think because of just what the budget is and it, we are allocated the numbers that uh, Commissioner Ryan stated. I think too, if I could, and I, you know, this is just throwing this out there, but it's at a time when we're also discussing and debating across the country and here in New York City, you know, the best use of police responding to people in distress and can it be better served by non-police response. And we're certainly uh, anticipating a pilot to get kicked off the ground in those regards here as well. So that's probably, that could be a factor. Okay. Um, okay, I appreciate that. That's all I have. I'll let my, my colleagues ask. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the support. I will now hear from Council Member Brooks Powers, followed by Council Member Levin. Your time will begin. Um, good afternoon. I had questions centered around the 116th precinct. Um, the 116th precinct, as I've been very public about, has been something that my commu community leaders in my district in particular have been advocating for for about 40 years now. Um, this is an issue where we saw about $95 million removed from um, the budget in the last fiscal year. Um, and most recently has been uh, reallocated um, to move forward. I just would like to have um, some questions answered around the timeline um, for the construction of um, the precinct in a real way, because I think there's some cautious optimism from members of the community not wanting to see this money um, yep. withdrawn yep. once again. And so um, some of the questions that I have is um, just confirmation that we are moving forward with the same design. Um, when the, the timeline in terms of when the construction will actually begin, um, as well as how large will the precinct be um, in terms of how many like resources are being put into it, what does that look like? Um, what is the community spacing going to look like and how it's um, accessed by the community as well. So I just want to start with those few questions first and pause and get those responses. Um, yeah, Councilwoman, I'll start it. Um, I've heard the same from members of the community in Southeast Queens that they're, they're very happy, but they don't quite want to claim victory until there's a shovel in the ground. Um, we are ecstatic that the funding has been restored for that because we think there's, as the community does, there's a great need there for that current 105th precinct, which is a very large geography. Christine can give you an update. Um, fingers crossed on what this timeline looks like. Good afternoon. So uh, we anticipate and uh, feel very confident that we'll have a shovel in the ground, so construction literally starting before the end of the calendar year, we're actually working to even accelerate that. Uh, and um, we anticipate it'll take approximately two and a half years to complete the construction. Uh, this will include a community space, uh, and the, it is the design that was previously um, agreed upon, and that's part of why we're able to move quickly now that the funding has been restored because the design is done and we're uh, moving forward with that design. And the design includes dedicated separate community space with designated community entrance. So we're moving as quickly as possible uh, and we will continue to update you and the community on the timeline as things move forward. Okay, thank you. Council Member Brooks, yep. Sorry, I was trying to come off of mute. <laughs> all, all the security on the mute button. Um, so, so going back to the timeline, just wanted to zero in more because obviously the calendar year going to December um, is quite far out. We know the mayor's term is coming to a close soon. Do we know if this is going to happen at the end of the summer, September, October? Like, what does that look like in terms of shovel in the ground? So uh, the funding was restored last week. 
So we've been having multiple meetings since then to uh, revisit the timeline, working with the construction contractor so we can go ahead and register that contract as quickly as possible, which we're hoping to do within a couple of months. The absolute outside date would be the end of the calendar year for Shovel in the Ground, but we are really working to move that up and do it more quickly. Within the next few weeks, we'll have an even tighter timeline for you, but we agree with you. We want to move this forward as quickly as possible and make sure that those resources, which were just restored, uh, end up getting committed and moving forward as soon as possible. And so we know $92 million in one fiscal year is a, is a significant amount. And so is there any, um, I guess, areas of, of like blind spot that we need to be concerned about in terms of the funding um, in fiscal year 22 for the construction of this precinct? No, I think we, we feel so the design's already been done, uh, which enables us to uh, assess and we already bid out the contract for the construction. So this is the construction um, contractors bid. Uh, so we feel very confident that the resources that are in the budget, obviously unforeseen can, things can happen with construction, but we don't anticipate that. So we feel confident that the resources that we have will enable us to build the precinct and complete it within two and a half years from the point at which we begin construction. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Council Member Levin, followed by Council Member Diaz. The time will begin. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear your council member. Okay, thank you. Um, I apologize for, for being um, off video here. I am, I'm, I'm doing parental duties at the moment. Um, uh, so, um, I want to thank you very much for um, uh, for your, for being here and, and for your team. Um, uh, so my first question is: we, we I asked I asked um, uh, in the preliminary budget hearing uh, back in March for a breakdown of overtime in FY21 um, by overtime category. Um, so that would be operational overtime, court overtime, um, et cetera. Um, uh, broken down by rank. Um, did you provide that to the council? Yes, we, we provided that detail to the council, council finance. Okay. Okay. Um, did okay. So I'll follow up with council finance. I, I, I don't know. Cause it went to the, it went to council finance. I'll follow up with council finance, but, uh, if, if, if that's the case and thank you, if not, um, I'm going to be following up with them, um, on that. Um, um, <clears throat> The same question, Commissioner, this is um, uh, uh, for you. Um, so, you know, being that we're about a year now into, um, a little over a year, I think, into this increase in, um, in serious, uh, in serious uh, violent crime, so shootings, um, um, homicides, um, what, I, I, I'm trying to get at, what, are, what do you think are the reasons for that based on data and analysis by the police department? Did you, what can you, you share you, with if us? If you can read my lips, I just said, you know, like, oh, Lord, or oh, God, because this there's so much at this point, And that's the honest truth. There are so many factors. Um, it will not be done in five minutes, and it will not do it justice. Um, I, I, you know, my, my public comments are on record. Uh, many do not agree with them, um, and, and I respect that, but I think people know what I've said. I haven't been shy. I believe what I said, and it's on record. Okay, but I'm, is that based on then on, on data and analysis? I'm trying to get at, I mean, cause, cause I, as, a, as a council member, um, I think about these things as well, and yeah. I'm trying to get, and I'm trying to get a good sense of, of, why is this happening? Is it, is, you know, um, uh, I, I, I read a, a quote by, um, by uh, John J. Professor Chris Herman, uh, who used to uh, be a data analyst, analyst at the NYPD. Um, and um, Professor Herman, Dr. Herman said, um, you know, that he, he attributes it a lot, a lot of it 
to the effects of COVID. Um, so issues around uh, social isolation, unemployment, uh, loss of income, um, things like that, um, and not so much uh, bail reform. Um, you have a you have a uh, a uh, response to that analysis. Well, I, I just told you, I think that um, at this point there are many, many factors and it's going to be studied. Wouldn't shock me if it'll be studied and talked about for decades at this point. Um, you know, how far do you want to go into this in your last one, one minute and 15 seconds? You know, this, uh, this is what I'll say. You know, I have 30 years with this police department now. I've had a number of positions. I ran CompStat. I have a somewhat unique insight into the, the inner workings and all of the crime data in New York City, from complaints to 311 to arrests to what happens to arrests. Um, you name it. And you cannot expect um, – Two, two, two different people today, and I respect everyone's opinion, mentioned the Rikers Island population. Nobody mentioned the prison population today, down dramatically as well. You cannot upend a fragile system of criminal justice dramatically and not expect a reaction. And we, we see, we've seen a reaction. Um, it is now complicated immensely by a lot of other factors, including COVID. Um, until we wrap our hands around this and start addressing that, we have um, a long road ahead of us, I believe. Thank you, Council Member Ledrum. We'll go on to our next Council Member. Sorry, I, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Sorry, I just had... Uh... Uh, one more question, Chair, if that's okay. Um, Commissioner, so I have a number of uh, NYCHA developments in my district. I have seven NYCHA developments. And um, uh, I've had at, at two of the developments uh, a number of shootings lately. And, um, and when I talk to residents there, what they want is, um, is, a, is the, a MAP program. So this is the, 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 the Mayor's um, Action Plan program. That's at 15 developments in the city. Um, is that jobs something and funding that... too, right? Jobs and funding. Sorry, and that comes with jobs and funding. Right, right. So, is that? I mean, when we're looking at um, at our budget priorities, you know, the map. There, are, you know, obviously there are many, you know, multiple multiples of fifteen developments in the city. There's probably a few dozen developments in the city, um, and uh, you know, or fifty developments in the city, sixty developments. Um, you know, they're not at the, the, the developments in my district that are um, that are seeing an uptick in shootings. Um, are you is, is NYPD? Are you working with the head of Mock J, the mayor, first deputy mayor, on identifying where programs like MAP um, can be expanded? Because you know, there there are fifteen there are fifteen of these MAP programs across the city. Um, but it doesn't do any good at the two developments in my district that need them. Well, I can tell you that um, the answer is yes, ongoing. We discuss uh, crime issues. We discuss criminal justice issues. We discuss uh, grassroots organizations. We discuss violence interrupters. We discuss, you know, school programs and all the interaction of all of these things. I would refer you to Mark J regarding specific questions about the MAP program, because I believe it emanated from there. Okay, but it's certainly something that I would hope that that you and the NYPD, seeing the value in what it, in what it, it, it does, um, would advocate um, to the mayor to expand that um, to additional developments around the city. Again, 15 developments around the city is like nothing. I mean, that's not going to make a real difference. So, um, I mean, it, it, it's got to be, it, if it's going to be impactful, uh, it's got to be uh, expanded significantly. So I would, uh, I would uh, hope that, that you would lend your, your, your support uh, to an expansion of that program. I think it's a discussion that has to be held and then it has to be weighed 
Dave Barrera, if you want to jump in, but it has to be weighed against, you know, what programs are out there, how do you measure their effectiveness, how much money do they cost, do you, re do you believe the metrics that exist, if any, or maybe they don't exist, and then, you know, whether it's us, City Hall, yourself on the council and everyone has to make these tough decisions in tough times. And, and that's a good thing. Dave. Understood. Understood, Commissioner. I, I just, what I would say is that, I mean, and, and, you know, with all due respect, you, you said that in the passive voice, you said discussions must be had. What I'm, what I'm hoping to hear from you is I, as Commissioner of the NYPD, will advocate for these types of things. Exactly what I said. Uh, good program. Well, it, it has in to be passive voice. You said they, they, they're going to be advocated. You're going to be discussed. I want I want to hear from you. Yes, I will advocate uh, for these types of programs to be expanded in the FY22 budget is what I'm looking well, for you to say. I, well, you're looking for something that I'm not saying. Perhaps that's the problem. It will be against mm -hmm. the backdrop of everything else that I have many people coming to me advocating for different programs. You need to, I think we need to have them all, lay them on a table, and then make uh, intelligent, concrete decisions based on facts. And, and there's going to be a lot of different opinions, too, and I think that's a good thing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. We'll now hear from Councilmember Diaz, followed by Councilmember Riley. Your time will begin. Good afternoon. I'd especially thank both chairs for this amazing opportunity. I've been in office since, since December, and not once have I had the opportunity to engage with the commissioner. Thank you, sir, for highlighting 127 Penn, one of my baby products before coming on, and to Chief Madry for also bringing in the graffiti removal approval program into the district. I have spent about $130,000 for graffiti removal, so thank you for highlighting my work and my efforts. I would have liked for the time to put in the district for you to take out some time to meet with me. I am sure Chief Ferrer, Madri, and Petri can vouch for who I am in my deliverables. Again, thank you for not meeting with me for highlighting what I, what I brought to the table. My, my, my actual question is in, rest, in reference to the selection of the commanders to, to the precincts. I'd like to know what the reality process is and then share with you all what my experience was in choosing the officer for the 83rd precinct. Okay, uh, the timing is perfect on this one, uh, so I'm going to kick it to Rodney, who's just undergone the first two selections. Uh, I think with uh, you know Juanita and the team this week. Um, so Rodney, without further ado, Council Member, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your question. So on May 10th, uh, we started our Community Commander Selection Committee. Uh, we had four commands that we've identified that had vacancies or three of them that had a vacancy, one of them where we were looking to uh, find a, another commanding officer, those being the 8-3, the 115, the 75, and the 107 precinct, unfortunately due to the loss of Dennis Mullaney. So the way we created the, this panel is we identified the community board president the community council president, and then we went to the borough president and asked uh, that president, depending on the borough that, they're, that they have coverage or ownership to, to identify one resident as well as one business owner. Then what we did was we had the, those four individuals, and I'm going to talk about how we're expanding on that in, in a second. Uh, we gave uh, the four panel, the four individuals on the panel, the opportunity to take an hour and as four candidates, and those names were supplied by my office, um, pretty much questions regarding what their thoughts are regarding being a precinct commander in, in, that, uh, in that area. And uh, we came up with some pretty good selections, some pretty good choices. If I could just say, in the uh, 115 precinct, uh, Jamal Altahari was uh, nominated to become the commanding officer of that precinct. Uh, Captain Sanabria was selected for the 83rd precinct, and right now I believe uh, that Rohan Griffin was selected to uh, take over the 75 precinct. We'll get the results of the 107 precinct uh, probably later on this week. Also, I want to share to you that we're going to expand the panel, not just to those four individuals, but we're also going to identify uh, the rest of the community council 
uh, team, be it the vice president, the treasurer, the secretary, um, to also be part of this, of this selection committee uh, going forward. And then even after that, there's going to be a couple of phases that we may even extend it out further to people that attend or residents uh, that attend the community council meetings on a, on a regular basis to be part of the selection process also. So once again, it was still in the infantile stages. Uh, we've gone through four precincts right now, and we're looking to expand to a couple other precincts going into the near future. So I, I thank you for breaking it down to me. What's my understanding is the selection for the 8-3, Friday afternoon, they were given notice that resumes would be coming, an emergency meeting on Sunday, and an hour or two hour meeting on Monday, whether they had to select. This process to me is too serious, is too impactful to tell anyone on a Friday afternoon, you got to make time to do this. On a Sunday afternoon, we're doing this again. And Monday, you need to figure it out to make yourself available. Otherwise, although you've been recommended and selected, you're going to be dismissed. I'm not saying oh. Sanabria was a bad choice, but the way this was played out was unfair and unfortunate for the people that volunteered. Again, our people are volunteering. And I think Brass needs to understand and, and understand that seriously. We want members of the community to stand up, but you also have to work with us. Okay. You don't get paid for what we do. And I say us because I've got 33 years of, of volunteering for the system. So council member, this is the first uh, time I'm hearing about this. I apologize if there was any inconvenience. Once again, uh, we're still in the infantile stages of this whole new process, but I will make sure uh, under my leadership, I'll make sure we tighten up going into the future. And Time has expired. Can I have just 30 more seconds? You know, I, I need transparency. I'm sure Griffin is gonna be amazing, but two months ago, that was the name on the street. So what was the point of the purpose of the people getting together if at the end of the day, that was the determination. That, that's pretty impressive to me. Well, if you don't mind, I could uh, politely disagree with you, even though his okay. name was in the mix, doesn't mean that he would have been selected. So once again, there was an interview process and he was chosen fairly by the people on the panel. So I don't think anybody was persuaded to have to pick uh, uh, Captain Griffin, but he, had to, he ended up being the best candidate for the job. Okay. I'm just asking for transparency and time for our volunteers to accept the process and understand what they're doing. Thank you. Understood. We now have questions from Council Member Riley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, NYPD, uh, for your services. Uh, we truly appreciate it. I'm going to give a special shout out to the 4-7, the 4-9, the 4-5, which are the precincts that I represent. Um, I guess my concerns really come from, um, I'm a new uh, elected council member, so I'm going around me and uh, all the uh, NCOs, all the commanding officers, and an uh, issue within my community has been illegal truck it, trucks um, being left uh, around the district. It. Um, and, and what we're hearing is there was a cut in the budget. That's why um, NYPD doesn't have the man um, power to actually pick uh, these trucks up. So is there any uh, solution to that going with this year's budget? Well, the, I don't like the answer, so let me start with that. I mean, we got to find a way to be responsive. So I know, uh, you know, earlier today, Councilman uh, Danique Miller and probably Councilwoman uh, Adams as well, that's come up, I believe, in both of their districts, and we find a way in Queens to address it. We got to find a way in, in the Bronx to address it as well with the resources we have. So, Rodney, if you could follow up with Juanita on that one. And I know, you know, whether it's East Chester or Boston Road up there, that's a historical problem. And it's a big problem for the community. So we, we will um, follow up with you and we'll do better to address it. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, my next question is uh, the NCO program. Uh, we work very closely uh, with the NCOs within our community, but we do realize it's about four sectors uh, within each precinct and about two NCOs uh, per sector. Is there any plan on expanding how many NCOs we will put in each sector moving forward? Well, we certainly have spoken about it. Um, there's nothing imminent. Um, 
I would love to have more. Um, we're not close. I'm looking at Rodney to my right here, um, and Juanita's not in the room, but either of them can chime in. What I would say is, before I turn it to them, the concept has always been it's not just about the NCOs. It's got to be all the cops. So every sector has two NCOs, but they also have a number of police officers that are assigned in the same area every day. And we got to kind of make sure that they breathe and live and, and treat the members of the community with the same um, sense of, you know, responsiveness and customer service. So no imminent plan to add officers. Um, discussions certainly have taken place, but nothing imminent. And uh, Juanita, maybe I'll go to you first and Rodney, you can clean it up. Right. I just think that, um, first of all, good afternoon. Uh, I just think that, you know, we push the concept of NCO when it should, really should be NCO team, right? Mm -hmm. they are, the sectors are there. They work the same area, just like the NCOs. They work different tours. So naturally, they all have cell phones. They're all supposed to be part of the community to community solutions. The NCOs are communicating with them, facilitating relationships, introductions, things of that nature. But naturally, there are issues that occur on different platoons. So I like to refer to them as the NCO team. <laughs> as, the, as the NCO team. And I think when it's looked at by the public that way, they realize, oh, not only my NCOs, but I should have the phone number of the other three teams as well. Um, and, and I just have one more question, uh, Commissioner. Uh, my last question, another thing that's plaguing our, our district and the entire New York City is gun violence. Um, what is the plan uh, moving forward? Um, there has been plenty of shootings within my district, um, especially yep. with uh, the youth. Um, we do realize that they're engaging in a war, I guess, on social media. So I, is there kind of a plan to engage community, clergy, uh, police officers, uh, within communities, uh, within the district to kind of combat against the gun violence. Uh, just to answer that myself, we're doing a pilot program in East Chester with the 49th Precinct, uh, where we're going to be engaging police officers, clergy, and every uh, stakeholder within the community uh, within uh, to do an event within the district and kind of a plan to have conversations about gun violence. So is there an immediate plan uh, throughout New York City to kind of address this? Yeah, and, and Jeff Madry, you can follow up with some of the the efforts with community affairs. I, I think, Councilman, that you, you you hit it right on and you, you, you heard my remarks to open up how important it is to us. The good news is we, we you know, everyone knows what the, the, the difficulties are, so let's talk about some of the positives. You know, we've done an incredible amount because it starts and ends with trust, and we've done an incredible amount of work investing in that, whether it's the work through Chauncey Parker, Juanita Holmes, Jeff Madry, and all the thousands of cops under them to really have those relationships and have those meetings. Uh, we've worked incredibly with the clergy across New York City, um, knowing that we can't do it all alone, to, to how can they help with this. We've partnered with the local district attorney's offices and done guy, gun buybacks. There's a, I retweeted one today that the... Uh, New York State AG is doing that's coming up soon. So we're going to continue to do them as well. We're also not re relying on gun buybacks. We're doing a lot of proactive police enforcement on people with guns. We've recovered more guns in the last 12 month period than at any time, probably in 25 years, which is good and bad at the same time. We do have a number of officers getting out of the academy last Thursday and Friday. They're going to be hitting their precincts this week. That's a shot in the arm, which is well received, and, and that's going to go a long way. But it's going to be a, a, uh, a real time to buckle down and continue to work real hard with the detectives that are under Jimmy Essek, the patrol officers under Dave Barrer and Juanita Holmes, and to keep working with our prosecutors on that small number of people that are, are just, you know, for whatever reason, unwilling to put guns down and you know, risking everyone's public safety. So it's a lot of different things that are going on. Um, I, I've well, you know, spoken about at this point and chronicled. I do think that we need some help on some laws and some, you know, uh, of that side of the equation, not to lock people up and throw away the key, but we can't have the over and over and over again either, because that's 
some of what fuels this, I believe, in that people see people caught with guns all the time and they're on the street. And then it becomes a cycle. You said social media beefs, drug turf beefs, other things where they say, well, if, if I know they got a gun, I need a gun too. And that never ends well. So all of this we're working on and we're lo looking to continue to partner with everyone to make New York City safe. Dave, Jeff Madry, anything specific you want to mention? No, uh, just in, in regards to what the council member said, we already been on the phone with Pastor Jay Gooden. We're fully plugged in. We're bringing resources to that, uh, you know, that to that event, which is really based or based on reducing gun violence and bringing communities together. We're 100 percent plugged in with that. We have so many other with these type of events of events already waiting to go. So it'll be an interesting summer, a very busy summer. And, and councilman, the key here is, and I believe this, like no kids want to join a gang. So we got to give them other options. And, and whether that's through the police department, uh, explorers, cadets, just running sports leagues, or maybe it's us working with you and other partners, uh, you know, and helping you in any way that we can. But, you know, Chauncey Partner, activating spaces and opening up basketball courts, all of this, we got to give them options. No, I totally agree with you, Commissioner. I'm just going to end with this. Uh, no kid does want to join the game, but sometimes you're pushed to it. That's uh, right. I myself, when I was younger, I went to join the gang at one point yeah. because I was getting pushed towards that direction. Yeah. But there was always resources in my community. That's why it's important that we continue to invest in the community. So I thank you, Chief Madri. I, I thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Chairs, uh, for your diligent work. And I'm going to yield my time. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to hear from Council Member Amphrey Samuel. That will be our last question, and then we'll uh, close out after that. Good afternoon, everyone. So much has already been said, and so I just have one quick question, and um, I'm sure Chief Holmes will be able to answer this one because we, we've had a lot of discussions about it already. Um, the Brownsville Safety Alliance has been a very um, important tool um, when we look at police reform and just public safety in communities um, that have a high level of crime. And, um, and, and I want to say that the Brownsville Safety Alliance, the corridor itself was very positive and it was a success. And that is NYPD working with community-based organizations, trio violence groups, as well as city agencies. All of the city agencies were out there. Um, I'm asking this question during the budget hearing because all of the groups and the city agencies look to see how much it will cost them to be able to be of service along that corridor for the week. And so because we did come up with a budget, again, NYPD officers looking at crime and, and the reporting time with patrol. And I know, um, Chief Holmes, you mentioned that this was a great initiative and that it should be scaled up and possibly expanded across the cities, across the boroughs. And so I'm asking you, um, you know, can you just kind of chime in about this, this new safety alliance initiative? From your perspective, and as and because we're in a budget hearing, um, can you talk to you know? Have you looked at what this looks like? Does it decrease crime, and maybe there's some cost savings, um, or you know, like how we may be able to allocate funding to the DA's office or you know other city agencies like HRA and ACS who are also along the corridor during this time. So and that's yeah. my only question, and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you uh, for the question. So yes, yeah, so this has been expanded. It's currently in 52 precincts, it's called Community Solutions. I, uh, I believe that's what council member Riley was referring to when he spoke about the 4-9 precinct. A lot of initiatives going on, but I think what's more important is that continued conversation, working together, relationship mm -hmm. focused on, I believe right now we're focused on probably 102 locations that were developed and designed with the community at the table, the district attorney, elected officials, in those particular precincts. And with that moving forward, hopefully there's success there and then it can move on. The only thing I can answer to is the budget aspect of it because it's not something that I took into consideration. However, I do know it takes time. It takes time to shut down a, a city street and, and declare it a play street during the hours that normally shootings are going on. It takes time in a Chief Herrera shop in the 101 precinct over in the 40 projects where uh, Inspector Eric uh, Robinson is working diligently with community-based organizations and district attorney's office to reduce crime there. It, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of time. So it's something moving forward now I will take a hard look at 
as far as what does it take as far as a budget's concerned to actually keep that up and running? Because that's the most important thing. It's not one and done. It's not uh, play a basketball game and it's over and another one is six weeks. It's constant communication, sitting at the table, devising a plan, de developing who's going to be tasked with initiating uh, that plan and following it through on a regular basis. And, and that's where you'll get success. Um, so I hope I answered some of your question, minus the budget aspect, but I will look into that moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. Anything further, council member? I, I, oh, sorry, council member Amprey Samuel, was that your only question? Yeah, she may not be able to respond, but council member, uh, Chair Adams, did you wanna uh, close out? Uh, is something to close out? Just one final question uh, for me, Chair Drum, uh, and, I, and I think I would be remiss if I didn't uh, broach this question. Commissioner, I'm uh, troubled as I am um, the rise in anti-Asian uh, hate crime that we've seen in the city um, since the pandemic started. I think it's actually gotten worse. Um, we're actually going to take this as our vote tomorrow in our stated meeting, but I wanted to ask you where we are in terms of numbers um, what is happening, how we're working with the AAPI community and what we're doing overall to combat this trend. Thank, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Adams. And um, Chief Esther can give you the numbers that falls under him in terms of where we are specifically. Um, I think that the opportunity here is that we're all New Yorkers and all coming together and supporting um, whatever group uh, is falling victim to this hate. And it's, that's the one good thing that you see here, but clearly an attack on a member of the Asian community here. We, we, we still are seeing it uh, with too much frequency and, and it's, it is uh, troubling. Jimmy, can you go into yeah, just sure. what the numbers are and what we're doing about it? Yeah, sure. Uh, overall, as of uh, May 9th, 185 hate crimes this year versus 108 of particular is uh, the Asian hate crimes, 81 verse 17. So uh, the top commands for that is Manhattan South, the 5th, 7th, 9th, the 109 precinct. In those 81 incidents, we've made uh, 23 arrests, uh, totaling 41 incidents. Of note in those uh, 23 incidents, of the 23 arrested persons, 11 of them have uh, very substantial prior uh, emotionally disturbed history uh, hi history in their backgrounds. So uh, what, are, what are we doing about it? Well, we've upstaffed our uh, hate crime staffing. We're now at 26 uh, members of the service just assigned specifically to the hate crimes unit. We have an anti-Asian hate crime task force with 33 additional members throughout the city. They assist the, with community outreach and in the investigation of all hate crimes. They speak multiple dialects of, uh, uh, of uh, Chinese, uh, uh, Mandarin, Cantonese. There's some uh, Korean members of the service. A a every member is represented there. They have great community outreach and uh, assisted in the uh, investigation. We have also have done uh, operations, uh, anti-Asian deterrence. Uh, task force where we put out Asian undercovers in various neighborhoods and that has resulted in three pickup arrests where our undercovers were harassed uh, in, in this. So we continue to look at it, we treat it very seriously, uh, we, we monitor it uh, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, take things uh, down. We also work, um, Chair Adams, we also work very closely with you know, City Hall's office to prevent hate crimes as well. Obviously, there's an education before. Let's try to collect, correct it before it ever becomes a crime. So, you know, there's a lot of outreach. We, wor we work with our fraternal organizations. I'm actually uh, attending a dinner tonight with one of the Asian fraternal organizations in the NYPD, which also serve as a bridge to some of the communities in New York City. So uh, it's something that we're very concerned about. Um, as you know, likewise, when we had a similar discussion about a year ago, a little over a year ago, when we saw a rise in anti-Semitic crime. 
Um, it, it really affects all New Yorkers, and it's really a blight on New York City. So we're, we take it very seriously. Okay, thank you for your response. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, it's been a very spirited hearing. With that, I turn it back over to Chair Drum. Thank you very much. And before I close it out, I want to say we were joined by Council Members Van Bremer, Traeger, and Barron. And this will conclude today's hearing. Thank you to the NYPD for testifying today. Before we close, I'd like to remind the uh, Finance Committee uh, members that we will continue our remote executive budget hearings again on Friday, May 14th, beginning at 10 a.m. And we will hear from the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, <coughs> excuse me, the Department of Sanitation and the Department of Small Business Services. <coughs> excuse me. As a reminder to the public, the committee will be holding a remote hearing with we'll public testimony on the executive budget on Tuesday, May 25th at 10 a.m. If you would like to testify at that hearing, please register at www.council.nyc.gov slash testify and information about how to access the Zoom meeting will be emailed to you. You may also submit written testimony through that registration website or by emailing testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, thank you, Commissioner, and to all the members of the NYPD who were here today. Council, thank you. Thank you to all the members of the council. Thank you, sir.